like that. <coughs> so you take you sit down, Chris. Okay. Sure. So um, yeah, you have an accountant, and then you have an accountant, and then you have a flipping legend of accountant, which is what Chris is. And um, a lot of the time, when you have an accountant, they just do the minimum work for you. They just do the minimum standard stuff. And they're not very entrepreneurial. They don't dig deep into your lifestyle and what you do. And, and you end up paying these ridiculous tax bills when you, you don't have to. And it's all lawful too. It's not schemes or stuff like that. It's all within the law. And that's where Chris has made a name for himself. He won't, I'm going to have to say it because that publicly, but he also he looks after my mates, Rob Moore, Mark Homer, and um, well, we all use him for a reason, because he's damn good, he's really, really good. And when I, when I went with Chris, it was Robert introduced me to Chris, it's, uh, moving accountants is, can be one of the most stressful things of, of, your, of your life, because they kind of got the grips on you, but it weren't too stressful, Gemma, was it? Yeah, he wasn't stressing for you. <laughs> <laughs> and he had to understand every element of my life, what I do, how I pay for things, and he wants a lot of things changed. I was basically doing everything wrong. They were completely everything wrong. It cost me a fortune. And we're at a place now where it's it's good. And I have kept the receipt for the travel up, gentlemen, for your ass. So I'm <laughs> all about keeping keeping things and and living your life outside of the business. So taxes is our biggest expense that you're ever going to have. That's true, Chris, right? In, in, in your yeah. at the moment, currently, anyway, it's the biggest expense. And the predictions for it is that it's only going to go one way because the country is 2.5 trillion in debt. Yes. So, sorry, it's so UK 2.5 trillion in debt, which is not good. And that's come out of the pandemic and them printing money and giving out... Um, What's the technical word for it? Possible quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. Quantitative, mm -hmm. Yeah, printing money basically. Bounce back loans, coronavirus loans, all this stuff people thought they were getting. The grants that a lot of you got, that you got taxed on. Well, all of us, including me, we we were advised by my former accountants that a lot of it would be wrote off. Now they all want it paid back, don't they? And not only will you pay it back, you get taxed on a lot of it too. So it's created this gigantic problem for the government. And the only way they seem to know how to get out of the situation is to raise the taxes and of course inflation has gone up which has pushed interest rates up and rents have gone up like crazy too a lot of the small business rates release have been took away ours have been taken away from us i don't know quite why that is but we're taxing out the unit aren't we now so they're trying to tax you wherever they can the last time i heard they took on over two thousand new inspectors to go out that's mainly to cover people who are not paying back all these loans and so on so you, you need someone and, and it's not just a saving tax it's if you come out under attack and i've come under attack three times i was telling seb on the way seb in here oh yeah sorry seb. <laughs> uh, seb on the way here, up here that it's when you come into attack from these guys it's pretty he's, he's been under attack from before no it's, it's it's something else it's like a very terrifying experience and it's not a three month job is two years and they have got more power than you'd ever believe they can come in they can go in, they can go into your house they can do anything can't they for a reason they got, especially vat vat can yeah yeah they've got powers of entry so with me i i had an okay and i just had a normal everyday accountant who served me right for when i started the business i didn't want to leave him because i wanted to be loyal a guy called jeffrey floyd and he was cheap he was you know he was a couple of grand a year if that and, but he just did the basics, you know, the office at the home, is it 30% really basic? Uh, he, he didn't know much about all the other bits and pieces. And when I st started earning lots and lots of money, he didn't, he didn't want me anymore, basically. He wanted me to go to a firm of accountants, and we went to another one not far from here. And we outgrew them. And then I went to another accountants who were great up until lockdown. Then after lockdown, it all went downhill. I can't get hold of the partners I need to speak to. I don't need a secretary who doesn't know what she's talking about. And they keep changing all the time. And, and it's a shame. And there's been quite a few firms that have not been able to get their staff back in the office after the lockdown. I know some has had the same experience as I've had. Everyone of that company's had the same. Yeah. They were amazing. Yeah. They were the best. <laughs> I did refer you to them at Simon. I 
apologise for it, but I don't know what's happened. We've given them a long time now, but nothing's getting better. It's getting worse. So you need to have it. So it's not so much saving. It's if you come under attack, which at some time you will in your life, you need an accountant that they're scared of and that they will defend you and, and go, you know, and not cost you a fortune. Because also, if you get investigated, the first time around, I didn't have tax um, defense insurance. And I think it cost me about 15, 16,000 to defend it. And they ended up writing me a check at the end because they owed me money. It worked out for a thousand pounds, but I still spent all that money defending it. And that's a small county firm. But you can assure yourself against all these type of things now, which is really important to do. So there's so many things I've learned over the last 18 months, two years, through Chris and Chris's contacts and put into place. And so I thought, Chris promised me from the start, he's not here to pitch you on, I think. If you don't want to change your account, don't change your account. You can take this stuff back and tell them, I want this done. Because you, you remember, accountants work for you. It's not the other way around. And that's one thing Chris pointed out to me right at the beginning. When I met him at the St Pancras Hotel, he's like, I work for you, Matt. You know, it's not the other way around. And sometimes we forget that. If you say to them, I want this done, I want that done, and they say no, because they're not really educated or, or, or don't have that, that risk factor, well, it's not even a risk, it's lawful what, what's going on, then it's in your right to move. So for me, it was scary moving because I've been with this other company for 10 years and they've always done me good. But like I said, we started having bad experiences and, and weird things and things weren't being claimed for. So with a lot of you, I think I've, so some of you know here, last year I basically paid no tax at all, nothing lawfully because of all the mistakes that were made in the past and as and going forward what i would have i've not paid chris any fees too because what he saved me outweighs his fees by a long 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 way and the other thing too you automatically think oh chris is expensive like when rob told me oh, yeah i bet he's expensive because rob moans about costs and stuff all the time I and mean, he won't mind me saying that being recorded sorry Rob but you do <laughs> he does moan to you about it in the podcast so he does not he we're very expensive accountant but when you actually weigh it up with what Chris has saved me and what the other accountants didn't do and the trouble I could have got in and if they investigated on me I would have been in real trouble because I would have just been left in the dark I think trying to work it out myself whereas Chris has fought off HMRC they don't tend to go near him because um, they're scared of him Basically, because he's he he's towels down their job, and I think it's quite public knowledge about Rob's case within reason, isn't it? Rob's Marks, yeah, yeah. And you've been on podcasts and stuff about yeah. they had a major investigation, and they're basically running out of Chris's office, thinking, "I don't want to hear that." Thank you very much. They got to weigh up the costs. It's gonna, it's it's gonna help with you all. Now, a lot a lot of you too have got quite nice, expensive lifestyles, especially Simon Stubble, who's designed the gear and his holidays and. He's not staying in the camper van when you go away, Simon, are you? Not usually. <laughs> no. And there's lots of things you can do with that type of stuff as well. And um, within reason, whenever you go away, whenever you go <clears> abroad, <throat> especially in the now content creator industry, lesson planning, depends on what sector you are, working of any device, looking for new locations, whatever you, if, long, as long as you log it and do it properly, then it's all a tax write-off. So, like, Mr. Kelly's just been on a trip across Asia looking to expand MF for me, all across there, and to study martial arts, to bring skills and drills back from, a, from his, um, from his, how long are you away for, sir? Four weeks? Uh, two in Japan. Yeah. Two weeks in Japan. I was obviously longer than that. So you've been on how much the holiday cost you? <laughs> I think it's a, it's a business trip. Yeah. Yeah. It's a business trip. It's a business trip. Yeah, it's a business trip. It's a semantic. Roughly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I had to take quite a lot of little people. Why well, little people you can't do nothing with. That's true, isn't it? Yeah, your yeah. wife who's a Do partner. Wife who's a partner and, and children who aren't that childlike anymore because they're like 15 and yeah. 16 and you've got to pay adult prices for them. So. Uh, the flights were about six thousand, and and the rest, yeah, about twelve altogether. Yeah, yeah. So you, so your wife, so you're LOP, aren't you? LOP. Yeah, yeah. She's does any part, so are you. Yeah. So that business trip, you could pretty much wipe out most of that, couldn't he? 
So we've got a client that does a, a business trip. So if it's an LLP, husband and wife are the members, and they do a lot of podcasts. And they are saying that their podcasts are explaining, I know, properties abroad. So if they go to Portugal and do podcasts explaining properties in Portugal, because that's part of their podcast, well, that's primarily a business trip. So you've just got to make sure there isn't something called duality of purpose. And duality of purpose is that broadly, if you take the wife and kids and you have one meeting, you're there for three weeks and the rest of it's holiday, the revenue will say, well, that's actually you're trying to call a holiday a business trip. But if you are both members, because it's an LLP, and, and you can make anyone a member in your LLP, and an LLP must have, have at least two members, and it could be your, your spouse, your girlfriend, whatever, then that could be a business trip, if that's the primary reason for going there. But if there is a duality of purpose, i.e. you take the kids, then the chances are that you may swing the other way and not have it. So when what I think about with a lot of these things is that you might look, if I say follow your um, martial arts thing, you might say, well, that's a good student. Why is, it good? Why is he or she a good student? Well, it's just the way they deal things. And it's subtleties. And with tax, a lot of it is subtleties. What you'll be dealing with is, well, why is that in an LLP, not a limited company? Oh, because of the, it may be because of the VAT. It may be because of we're doing inheritance tax planning. And what you're thinking is that when, when I sat, saw Matt, I sat down there and I take loads of notes because... If you work out what the client is trying to achieve, you can point them in a certain direction. So, to give you an idea, that if you've got a choice of entities, then if we follow the martial arts situation, then some of the reasons we're doing this is we need to ensure that we are um, not charging VAT, why it could be um, exempt from VAT. Well, exemption from VAT, you can be a partnership or a sole trader if you provide those services personally. The VAT 70130 explains how it works. But it doesn't explain what an LLP is. So then if you look at the VAT directives on LLP, they'll say that LLPs actually come under that. And what, what you do is when you advise clients, you've got to work out the situation to make sure what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to make sure that's not that. Okay. What case have you got? Well, um, Premier Family Martial Arts is probably the main one. Now you could say, well, that won't help us because actually they lost. But that was 2020 case. And since then, I think if that was retested, you'll probably find there's a better argument to say that that is now, um, uh, I don't know, is it Olympic sport martial arts there? Taekwondo they, is. They lost because crisis. they were a limited company, not an LLP. Well, they would win if they were. Uh, I think they win now. Yeah. And what of it? A lot of it is—is is it taught in schools or universities? And then you then have to follow that. And if you thought that was an argument, then you set the structure up as an LLP structure. But what you've then got to be careful about is, well, if I've got a choice of entities, a limited company. Uh, sorry, if I go back a bit, basically, the precursor to all this is how do I start my business if I've got a choice. You can have, the, the main ones are sole trader, it's just me doing my business, say accountancy. I could be a partnership, so I could be in business with anyone. And that's called the old 1890 Partnership Act. So when Wild Bill Hickok was shooting up Dodge City, we were draw, drawing up partnership legislation. And that's just a simple how the old partnership works. The new legislation is a limited liability partnership. And it's the same, t you're taxed exactly the same, but you have limited liability. So if you want limited liability, you can have a limited company or a limited liability partnership. That means that the, the contract is in the limited entity, so you personally can't be attacked. So you might say, okay, well, I want the protection of the value in corporation. I want to be protected from that. But then the question is, well, why do we do it for tax? Well, if I've got a limited company and a limited liability partnership, I've got two businesses. I might have the LLP for VAT reasons, because I know that I don't have to charge VAT um, because of VAT 70130 on martial arts. However, if I've also got a limited company, what assets do I drop in each one? If I've got a car, the chances are any car I would probably have in an LLP because there's no taxable benefit in kind. If a car is in a limited company, you have a taxable benefit in kind, which means that even though you own the company, you are the shareholder, you are the director, the car is owned by the company, therefore if it provides that car to you, 
the company has to charge you a taxable benefit in kind, and it pays something called Class 1A national insurance. So assets like that you want in the LLP. Conversely, there may be other expenses. So if, say for, say for argument, you have medical checkups, then you might that want that expense in a limited company. There's, there's, work, there's bike schemes for <coughs> cycling to work. You can put that in the company, but you've got a choice of where you drop it. Now, if you then follow the LLP route, say I've got an LLP for martial arts, then that means um, I'm exempt from VAT. Well, that means I can't recover any of my input VAT. But say I want to be do some consulting as an accountant on the side, so I do martial arts and franchise and consulting. Well, then I would set up a separate business for my accounting, because that would be VAT registered, and then I can recover my input VAT on my services. I'll have to charge VAT. Well, that's fine, because my turnover is going to be £85,000. That is an exempt supply in, in the martial arts, if we can get that, which means you don't have to charge... Um, your customers an extra 20%, so you're cheaper, which is great. And that's assuming your turnover is over £85,000, because below £85,000, you don't have to be VAT registered. Now, what you've got to be careful of is something called disaggregation rules, if, if we look at VAT. So in the old days, when I was a trainee accountant, the boss and I used to go to the pub, and the husband would sell me a pint of beer, and the wife would sell me a ham sandwich. So they had two businesses under the, in the same pub, but the beer was charged at, uh, at the highest rate of VAT then, which was probably 17.5%, but food was exempt from that, which means that then she wouldn't have to charge me VAT on the food. And disaggregation is where HMRC say you're separating two businesses. So when you separate, so if Matt had a consultancy business for the sake of argument that was VATable, we need to ensure that the disaggregation rules can't hit him. So with a lot of these things, all I'm saying is that we need to work out where you want to be and then we can work out a route to get there. So one of the things you often find um, with a, this question is, well, when do I, why do I want an LLP or a limited company? Well, if for the sake of argument, you can make your partner, wife, husband, whatever, a partner in your LLP. So say I earn 200 grand, what's the point of me having a sole trading business earning 200 grand and my wife, for the sake of argument, being at home and not earning anything? Because over £125,000, I'm going to be a 45% taxpayer. If I earn more than £100,000, I lose my personal allowance. So the personal allowance is what you can earn tax-free. So I can earn £12,570 tax-free. If I earn more than £100,000, each pound, each two pounds I earn over hundred pounds, hundred thousand pounds, I lose my personal allowance by one pound. So once I've earned more than one hundred twenty-five thousand, which is a hundred thousand plus two times twelve thousand five hundred, I've completely lost my personal allowance, which means the first pound of income I earn, I'm taxed straight into tax. I don't have anything tax-free. So then, what my aim would be is to increase my wife's taxable <coughs> income and reduce mine. So if I could reduce mine to 100 and increase hers to 100, then neither of us lose our personal allowance, neither of us into 45% tax. She, at the moment, has got no other taxable income, so she wouldn't even be using her £12,500 tax-free. Broadly, the next £37,500, i.e. takes you to £50,000, £12,500 tax-free plus £37,500, means that she's, she then is a basic rate tax bound. Above £50,000, up to £125,000 is 40% tax ban, but you've got that kicker in over a hundred. So what you'll find is that when you look at this, you want to make sure, and uh, I hope you don't mind me mentioning it, Matt, but that hadn't been done with Matt, you see. And you, you've got to look at the whole of the scenario to work out how it... And then you look and say, well, wait a minute, this limited company, why are they borrowing money from the limited company? If a director borrows money from his own limited company, what HMRC say? Well, if he hadn't borrowed the money from his limited company, you would have gone to the bank, and the bank would have charged him interest. So therefore, we will force the company to charge you interest, and we're also going to make the company pay something called Section 455 tax, because there's an overdrawn director's loan account. And broadly, that's a third of what you've borrowed. So if I've borrowed 120 grand from my company, I have to pay interest to my company, 
and if I don't, it's a P11D benefit in kind, so I'm taxed on it. And then I have to pay a third of that 120 grand, 40,000 to HMRC. They will sit on that 40,000 pound until that loan has re been repaid. You get the money back nine months after the end of the counting year that that loan has been repaid. So they'll sit on your 40,000 pounds. If conversely you borrowed the money from your LLP, there's no such charge. So what you've got to think about is how you actually take your money out of the company. So if I had a limited company, let's say my company earned £400,000, I know that from the 1st of April this year, corporation tax has gone up to 25% on profits above £50,000. So that £400,000 profit in the company, I'm going to lose £100,000 corporation tax straight away. That leaves me 300000 if I then take the £300,000 out, the highest rate of dividend tax is 39.35%. And it's my company, so I've paid £100,000 in corporation tax, and then I'm going to pay 39.35% in dividend tax. If you add the two together, uh, you're, you're looking at like 59% tax, and it's my company, because I've paid corporation tax and income tax. If I've got an LLP, or a partnership, or a sole trader, the maximum rate of income tax is 45% because that's only pay income tax. So with a company, if it's your company, you pay corporation tax plus income tax. So what we're doing at the moment is a lot of people, clients that come to us, we're saying, well, do you actually realise you've paid corporation tax on your company and then you're paying income tax for you to live on? Because if you need to live on £400,000 a year, there's a better way of doing it. Firstly, we could take advantage of perhaps setting up an LLP. It may be that we bring, uh, so if you've got kids over 18, they're no longer minors, which means that you might want to make them members of the LLP. You might want to make your partner a member of the LLP. Suddenly that £400,000 could be spread over four people. So I've got two kids over 18, husband and wife, that's £100,000 each. You've brought the tax down massively and you haven't paid corporation tax. Then what you need to consider is what assets can I have in the LLP? Because there may be assets that I use for business that aren't in there. So we had a client that came to us and I said, how about we um, claim capital allowances on your car? Well, I don't use the car for business. Okay. Well, just, just tell me about your business. Well, Anyone who says that, by the way, is an idiot. <laughs> so, so I don't use my car for leisure. <laughs> so I said, um, well, how many times do you use the car? And he said, I'll probably use it three times a week. And how many times out of that do you use it for business? Probably once a week. So, well, that's the third, isn't it? So then I've got third of car insurance, third of car tax, petrol servicing, AA, Dartford Tunnel toll fees, parking, capital allowances on the car. And all that lot is free money. It's sitting there because they hadn't thought about it. So once you get to know your clients, you can think, well, actually, a third is better than nothing. And you can add up all the costs you're incurring that you've never got tax relief for. And I think the difference about what we do is that it's my name above the door. So actually take the bother of actually getting to know people, <coughs> then you can understand the situation they're in. And once you know the type of expenses they incur, you can say, so if you've got your house at home, you can say, well, um, actually, my accountant's done a good job for me. I'm claiming £6 a week, because that's HMRC rules, which is for a limited company. But if it's a limited company, the expense has to be wholly exclusively necessary for a business. If it's an LLP, a partnership, you don't have to have the necessary. So if I have a car and I take a business trip here, and let's say I'm an employee, and I've got a, a, a taxi from London to come here. HMRC said, it is wholly exclusively for business, yes. But is it necessary that you pay for a taxi? You could have got a, a bus or a train. If you're self-employed, that rule isn't there. So some clients have got Lamborghinis, Porsches. HMRC can't turn around and say, well, I think you should drive a Mini Moak or a Ford Fiesta. They, ha they haven't got that, that ability to do that. So therefore, if you want to claim that, and I've got the financing of all the cars, I've got the running cost of the cars, the insurance, because you like to drive for that car for business. They can't say you're not allowed a £400,000 Lamborghini. So 
it, you've got to sort of work out what type of expenses you can incur and how you claim the relief for. And if there's, say, the partners in the LLP are you and your wife, and if she does business and you do business, well, that's two cars. So it, it's all these expenses are, <coughs> once you get to know what you can claim, there's more that you can put in a, um, in a set of accounts that a lot of it is, is just sitting there. <coughs> so use the famous office. Generally, pe people say, if it's a limited company, I claim six pound a week. If you're in a partnership, they'll say, on oh, my accountant says I can't claim anything for my study at home because the house is free from capital gains tax. So therefore, when I come to sell the house, I don't pay capital gains tax on the sale of the house, which is true. However, that doesn't preclude you from claiming for the use of home as office. And what I normally suggest is that as long as it's not exclusively for business, so I normally say you can have some kids' toys there or piano, so when you're not in it, the kids can use it or whatever. So it's not exclusively used for business. So we've got clients that have got studies at home. They've got TVs in there, couches there, desks, chairs, bureaus, filing cabinets, computers. That's all tax deductible. And also, if this was your study and I change the carpets and decorate the walls, that's tax deductible because it's my study. So you can just, if you can think of the rules and expand those rules, there's amazing stuff that you can do. A lot of it, people aren't prepared to roll their sleeves up, A, to get to know their clients, and B, to understand what you can claim. And if you've got that sort of broad spectrum of knowledge, then you can work out where you can get the release for. And it may be that when I first met Matt, I said, well, that asset should be there because that will avoid that tax. And then you can move things around. So what we've done for some clients is they said, well, uh, give you an idea. We've got, we're based in Barnes. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Chris Wilkins and Wilkins South. Well, I just said you were a legend. <laughs> so, so we're based in Barnes. We've got 20 staff. Now, for each of those staff, I pay employers national insurance because they work for me. They do a great job, but they are employees. Now, in some of your circumstances, you might say, well, some of my, my guys actually, I could actually, I might want to bring them on as partners in my limited liability partnership. And if they then cease being your employee and our partners, then they can get profit share. You don't have to pay employers national insurance at 13.8% for what you pay them. They are then self employed, so they can claim expenses. And it may be that for some of the VAT reasons, for how we get VAT relief for, say, the martial arts, it may be that you want to bring them on because it may help us with a VAT inquiry. So if you've got a VAT inquiry, there's a, a case um, I was reading yesterday about Chelsea Cloisters where they've had a VAT visit probably every year for the last three years. And on the recent VAT visit, they said you should have charged VAT. And the VAT, we think, is five million pounds. And it, they said, you're joking. Every year if someone's come along and they said it's okay. But from customs and excise, they say, unless you, we give you a written ruling to say that you're, you haven't got, that, you're, that everything is correct, then a previous visit can't be relied on. So they've gone back four years and assessed this business, so four years is the maximum they can do without proving fraud or willful default. So they've got open VAT inquiries. So what you've got to do is if you think you're in grey areas, then you've got to make sure that your grey areas are protected for the downside risk. So Matt said that you can get insurance. So we have something called fee protection insurance. And that we offer that to all our clients. Now, what you need to make sure is that if there is a problem of inquiry, has your accountant dealt with one? So unlike a solicitor, accountant isn't a legally privileged word. So what that means is you could go to someone, and we've had a lot of these cases where a guy has gone to an accountant and it's ABC Limited and he's not qualified so if any of one of you want to set up tomorrow as ABC Limited accountants no one's going to stop you because accountant like I say is not legally privileged you don't have to have a qualification to call yourself an accountant but what you need to do is you need to check what qualifications that they have so we're a member of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants which means that we can audit limited companies and we have to go through six years training before that and then we go through something called CPD, which is Continual Professional Development. So, and, I, and when people ask me about that, I analogise it to, if I go to the doctor with a headache, 
I don't want to know the best headache tablet five years ago. I want to know the best headache tablet today. And so he is informed of the best tablets going around. And we also have to do CPD to make sure we're up to date with the recent VAT cases and recent tax cases because the legislation is changing. So therefore, if you advise a client, you need to know the up to date legislation. And then what happens is then you can say, well, I don't think that if there was an inquiry, they wouldn't win because of this case. And then you just, the HMRC will choose a case in an argument that they think supports them. And we find one that we think is better that supports our case. So if ever you got to that stage, you need to say to your accountant, have you done a revenue inquiry? And then how complicated is it, does it get? So the most complicated, I think, is something called a, a code of practice nine inquiry. And the, the example you may have heard of is Lester Piggott. So with Lester Piggott, um, he had a, an inquiry. They said, oh, Lester, we need to know where your money's coming <coughs> from. And he said, um, can, can, you, can we have a chat with you? And he said, well, what were you doing last week? And he said, oh, I was at, at Kempton for the 10.30 race. Then what happened? Well, I got a helicopter over to Ireland, and I had a, a race in Ireland. And then in the afternoon and uh, the evening race was in, in France, got a helicopter over there. They said, okay, that's multi-jurisdictional, so you've got different, different countries. So then that escalates to what's called a Code of Practice 9 inquiry. So the last Code of Practice 9 inquiry we did was where a client, not our client, um, had a pra had an, uh, was a property client and um, the accountant started work on it. He gave some information to HMRC, then HMRC said, where's the money coming from? He said, oh, well, I said, um, I had a Hong Kong investor and I sold a property in Ireland for him. And they said, why won't it stop? This is code of practice nine. So the accountant said, look, beyond me, go to Chris Wilkins. So we got this client. They'd already started the inquiry. Well, the analogy of this inquiry is not only has the accountant opened the stable doors, but the horses were halfway down the bloody road before we started. And I had to get the horses back because the accountant had released the wrong information. So some people say, or some accountants say, um, I like to be really helpful to HMRC. So they ask these questions and I just give them all the answers. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you've just given them more rope to hang yourself. The questions they can ask is governed by the Taxes Act and by statute. So we've got one that's come in uh, last week and um, they've asked a long list of <coughs> questions to our client and the client said, bloody hell, this will cost me a fortune. I said, no, I'm not going to answer any of them. No, you've got to, it's HMRC. No, you don't, because they have what's called an inquiry window. An inquiry window is when they can ask questions. So in this case, it's 12 months from the filing of the tax return. Well, that 12 months expired on 31st of October, so they're out of time. Now, if you don't know stuff like that, what you're going to do is say, oh, well, let's be helpful. I don't want to upset HMRC. But the statute is laid down for everyone to follow the statute, and they don't have more power not to follow it than we do. If the boot was on the other foot and they were within their time, then we'd have to answer the questions. But you've got to know the parameters of what you're dealing with them. So if you've done a code of practice, nine inquiry or something like that, then you're, you're up to date with this type of stuff. So just to give you an idea, that code of practice nine is, I don't know if you ever saw the bill, but it's, it's like with the police. It's recorded, they take they have microphones, they come mob handed, and we sit there and everything goes down. And at the end of it, uh, to pick up the Lester Piggott score, story, at the end of it, you have to sign on Hansard to say, these are my assets, these are my liabilities, and I've disclosed everything. And if that is the case, HMRC say, fine, end of story. What happened with Lester though, is that HMRC said to Lester, I can't remember the numbers, but it was big anyway. He said, look, you owe us £444,000. He said, bloody hell, I'll check it with my accountant. So the accountant said, well, you've signed your statement of assets. They know all your bank accounts. They know your liabilities. We've worked it out, and this is the right figure. You just have to pay them. So he said, OK, he paid them. The trouble with Lester, he paid them on a bank account he never disclosed. <laughs> so then, next stop, jail, and he lost his knighthood. And that's the trouble with Lester. So um, he ended up in jail because he hadn't disclosed everything. And that is a Code of Practice 9 inquiry, you, and you have massive obligations. We had one inquiry with, uh, under COVID that went on for four years because there's four different inspectors, because every time we wanted to deal with one, they'd move them, 
to um, <coughs> C-bill loans or bounce-back loans because they moved a lot of HMRC staff to try and get the overpayment loans back. And so they moved them from the inquiry, so had four different inspectors, and it took ages to settle it because each inspector wanted to ask their different questions. So, but you've just got to be robust in dealing with them. And in a couple of the instances that Matt was referring to, if we're not happy, we go to something called ADR. And ADR is alternative dispute resolution. We say, don't agree with the inspector. He said it's black, we said it's white. So we said, okay, we want a meeting. So then they had a meeting at our office and you actually get all the inspectors in your office and you get an invigilator from HMRC that's independent nothing to do with it and we just said look this is the circumstances and they sit in front of you and that's the only and that's one of the ways you can force them to a meeting and in the end they agreed with us because the invigilator said although they're HMRC that they don't have any knowledge of the case they just said one minute are you sure that that is right what you just said to Mr Wilkins and then what happened we get the result but you just got to stamp your feet sometimes and say look this is the rules you ain't playing by the rules so uh, a lot of the, the things you follow is that if you know the legislation, you're pretty much sure how they're going to hit you. You know what case they'd use, and you've got to find a more relevant case. So a lot of the cases they may pick up may be 10 years old, and you say, well, the circumstances have changed. This is more a, a specific case for our class circumstances. But the trouble is that if you are overly helpful, and I had replied to this client um, inquiry from HMRC, as soon as I've replied the information, I've opened the door and HMRC will then start the correspondence and they're in. And my client could end up with a tax bill that he wouldn't have had. Now, if your accountant doesn't know the rules, that's that's the, the problem you're going to get. So I mean, we get this a lot of LLPs too because they're still relatively new, Chris, aren't they? Yeah. <clears throat> I remember we had a lot of accounts when we moved to LLPs who just don't deal with them, don't understand them. As, but they are like the, the latest limited company of all the benefits linked to it. There's very little benefits to the limited company now. And it, I've worked out, just so you, you know, it's, it's down now because I've, I met Chris, but I was paying about 70p in a pound in tax. Yeah. Well, look at the other way. I'm working three quarters of my time, pretty much, for the government, aren't I? Mm. 70p in every pound I earn. It's pretty much good. I can't get the VAT back, which is a big issue. Not that I can do about that. Much, not much we can claim. Well, you guys, a lot of your VAC exempt, so you ain't got to worry by nature. <coughs> but LL, LLP is who's, LL, who's LLP here? Yeah, but most of you are. That's, that is the way to be with limiting your liability against lawsuits and all the other stuff that come after your personal assets and all the other stuff. And the key, the key thing I learned for Chris too is I live my life out of the business. And a lot of you, I, I know very personally, you pretty much live and breathe your business. So everything pretty much is a business expense. Do I explain that in a bit more of a... Yeah, so um, there's sometimes um, I'm in a meeting and the clients say, uh, well, I've got some entertaining expenses. I said, you haven't. You've got subsistence expenses. All oh, right, well, so what's the difference? Well, entertaining isn't tax deductible. Subsistence is. In the old days, you could get entertaining. Now, the only entertaining you get is staff entertaining. And if you haven't got any staff, you can't get it. But staff entertaining is up to £150 a head. Lucy's thinking all the parties she's had over the last few <laughs> years. <laughs> now, you can't go back a couple of years. Um, well, we did with you. We, we changed the prior year accounts yeah, to get yeah. the relief for. But if you've got subsistence... <laughs> so, all staff for the parties. So oh, I drive here. If I on the way home, if I stop for a sandwich and a coffee, that's subsistence because it's a business expense. Now, um, everyone, HMRC said, well, everyone has to eat to live. But the point is, I wouldn't be in Swindon. I'd, I'd take my sandwiches to work. So I wouldn't, it wouldn't have cost me the money. I'm only in Swindon because it's a business expense. So there's a famous case of Ernst Young where they sent um, some auditors to Leeds and they're in a hotel. And they said, well, we're only in the hotel because we're doing an audit here. Well, that's fine. Um, what about your food? Well, we are in the hotel. Well, that's fine as well. Wait a minute, what about the last night? Oh, the last night we went round the corner because the last night of the audit, we had a Chinese meal. But you're not having that because you went out of the hotel. Other than that, they gave them the food because you're in a hotel. So even though everyone needs to eat to live, that was allowed. So 
if it if you class an expense as if I put entertaining the set of accounts, it's it, you'll get won't well, get tax relief straight away. If it's subsistence, you will. Then it's a case of knowing what other reliefs there are. So there's things like trivial benefit reliefs that you can claim, and these these are tax deductible up to a certain amounts. And a lot of people don't even know these claims. So some of them mount up to thousands of pounds. You might say, well. Yeah. 50 quid here, whatever. But when you add the whole up at the end of the year, and if you're 40 or 45 percent taxpayer, the amount you can save is a fortune. And it's just a case of knowing how you claim them and where you claim them. Because generally, if I, know, if I was, say, Alan Sugar earning millions, then I might want a big chunk of my money in a limited company because the maximum rate of tax I'm going to pay is 25 percent. I'm not going to take it out. However, Alan Sugar does have something called AMSPROP and other LLPs because then that covers your living expenses. So if I needed £400,000 a year to live on, there's no point having £400,000 in a limited company because I'm paying 25% first and then I'm going to pay dividend tax taken out. So that's going to be 58 59%. So then if that was the case, I'd probably want an LLP, a partnership, sole trader, whatever. And given the choice, I'd want to bring in other family members if I could, if I could justify they, they did business work. So um, what you want to do is work out where you want to be. So I know some of you um, have got property. So we started, we started acting um, for um, Platinum Property Partners, which is the, I think the biggest HMO franchise in the country. And we set up the sort of the tax planning for that. And then um, Richard Davis, who's the director of that, refer and Steve Bolton, they referred me to um, Mark and Rob. Now, what we do with them is that you've got to work out with property where you want it to drop. So, in um, 2015, George Osborne introduced this thing called Section 24. And Section 24 says, with residential property. You're not, you're, you're not going to get any tax relief on mortgage interest. So it's not an expense in the accounts, it's a tax reducer. And the tax reducer means that you only get 20% tax relief on the mortgage interest. So let's assume in, in 2015, I earn £150,000 on PAYE. And £150,000 was the cusp upon which you paid 45% in those days. So if then I've got a rental property, and let's make it really simple, rental income was £10,000 and my only expense was mortgage interest, which is £10,000. So I didn't make a profit on the property, so I paid no more tax. Fast forward today, 10000 rental income will be taxed at 45% and the 10000 mortgage interest I only get tax relief at 20%. So I'm having a profit, a taxable profit, £2,500 on a property that doesn't make a profit. So what we've then done is that you, you've then thought of can we actually transfer those properties into a limited company? And a case that a lot of people have heard of is called Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey. And Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey relates to something called Section 162 Corporation Relief. And what you want to do, if I sold my one rental property today to my limited company, I create a capital gain. I bought this property many years ago for 50 grand. It's now worth 150 grand. So I say, well, I don't want to lose tax relief on this clause 24, so I'm going to sell it to my limited company. The trouble is that I, it cost me 50,000. It's now worth 150,000. So I've made a capital gain of 100,000 pounds. I'm going to pay capital gains tax on that residential property, even though I'm only putting it in my own limited company. I'm not selling it to anyone else. So that tax bill... That's 28%. Exactly. So Thank the you. highest rate of capital gains tax is 20%, other than residential property, which is 28%. So I'm going to pay £28,000 just to stick to my own company. So well, wait a minute, there must be a better way of getting around this. Well, the case that people rely on is Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey. So Elizabeth um, had 10 um, flats in Belfast, and she was renting five out at that time. And um, she went. Um, she then transferred those properties into her limited company. And she said, "I want to claim Section 162 business property relief, which means that those properties go in her limited company. And by claiming incorporation relief, then I don't pay 
capital gains tax. So in, in return for her 10 properties going in the limited company, the limited company gives her shares. And that's the, the bargain for that. And that doesn't crystallise a capital gain. So then it went to court, it went to what's called the first tier tribunal. The first tier tribunal said, well, you wouldn't get business property relief for um, moving those properties in there. So I'm not, get, I'm not going to give you the tax relief. So then her son took it to the upper tribunal. And the upper tribunal in tax is akin to a high court level. And it was heard by a judge called Judge Burner. And he said, well, I don't actually know why you're talking about business property relief, because business property relief is an inheritance tax. This is capital gains tax. So there's two main capital taxes. If I sell a rental property when I'm alive, I pay capital gains tax. If I don't sell it and die owning that property, I pay um, inheritance tax. Inheritance tax, you can claim a relief called business property relief, but not for residential rental properties. So Judge Berner said, well, that's not even the right tax because she's not dead. So she wouldn't pay in inheritance tax, she'd pay capital gains tax. Said, well, tell me a bit more about what you do. She said, well, um, I vet all the tenants in, I vet them out, I do the communal cleaning, um, I repair, repair fences, I do some easy DIY. <laughs> well, how much do you spend? She said, well, I probably spend 20 hours a week. So well, I think 20 hours a week and five properties is enough to claim Section 162 incorporation relief. And that means that she can put the properties in her limited company and the company gives her shares in return and you don't crystallise a capital gain. And that's the precursor to a lot of the tax cases and the legislation that people are referring to now. So if you wanted to do that, they generally use the case of Elizabeth Boyne Ramsey. And that means that you don't trigger a capital gains tax. Now, you've got to be slightly careful for what you wish for, because if I put the properties in the limited company, the limited company gets corporation tax relief on the mortgage interest, which is fine. But what you've got to bear in mind is when you sell the properties, the property is now owned by a limited company. So if those properties go up, say, £100,000 and you sell them, then the company pays 25% corporation tax and then you take it out of the company in the form of dividends or liquidate the company. So it's not the panacea, but if you're, if you're paying lots and lots of income tax, and we've got clients with over 60 properties, rental, rental properties, and therefore, for them, they're losing so much in the way of income tax because the tax relief on mortgage interest has gone down, then they had to do something like that. But you need to know the whole circumstances. So we had a client that came to us for their accountant, and he put them in a limited company. And when I ran through it, he wasn't even a higher rate taxpayer. So he's not saving anything, and the accountant charged him 10 grand for doing it, and now he will actually lose the corporation tax when he sells the properties. That's the liability. So there's loads of stuff going on property at the moment, and you may have heard of um, less tax for landlords, and you might have heard of Property 118. And both of those have been reviewed by a guy called Dan Needle. And if ever you want to read the tax on that, it, it's brilliant. So Dan Needle used to be head of tax for Clifford Chance, one of the top city law firms. And he, he does lots of investigations. He did Nadeem Sahawi, uh, some investigations on that. And he's pretty much taken both of those businesses to task and proved that they just don't work. So now what HMRC do is they've issued something called Spotlight. So Spotlight is sort of what, what it says in, in, on the tin. It, they are spotlighting these particular um, schemes, arrangements, however you want to call it, that they don't think work. So they've issued something called Spotlight 63. So now clients we're picking up who are with those firms have said, can, can you take me on and get me out of this mess? And Spotlight 63 said that less tax for landlord scheme just doesn't work. So then they are going to open up inquiries in all of these. So unless you've actually got someone who deals with revenue inquiries for properties, you need to get some help because the letters are basically along the lines of if you, don't, if you don't register with Spotlight 63 before the 31st of January 2024, then broadly reading between the lines, we're going to come for you. And if you do register, if you don't sort your, your affairs out, you've got problems. So what less tax for landlords did is they said, 
we will put your properties into a mixed partnership and it's mixed because it may be husband and wife and a limited company and they asserted that you would be able to claim something called business property relief well if you've got residential property business property relief is I've got a, a firm of accountants if I drop dead today god forbid then um, I will finish this. About <laughs> yeah. So then my estate would claim business relief, and business relief says that it's exempt from inheritance tax because I'm running a business. If I've got residential rental properties, that is not exempt from inheritance tax because it's not a business, because it's a passive rental stream. Now there's degrees. So I've got one rental property, um, and that definitely won't be a business. However, you could go along that spectrum and you say, okay, well, how about I make a guest house and I turn my, that house into a guest house and I make them um, breakfast in the morning. Well, then that is a business. I could turn it into a hotel. That is a business. So it's a case of a bit like Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey. One <coughs> property was not a business. In her case, five properties definitely is. So along that spectrum, five is your trigger point. But... If I just have a residential rental property and rent it out, I won't get that. That will be subject to inheritance tax at the rate of 40%. Now, if I had to pay tax on a residential rental property, I'd much prefer to pay capital gains tax than inheritance tax. The reason is, is that let's just say this property that I own cost me 50 grand, and let's say it's worth 350 grand today. So if I sold it today, my capital gain would be 350 less 50, 300,000 pounds. I will claim other expenses, but they 300. That 300 is taxed at 28%, so what's that? 78 grand. However, if I died today, it would be 40% of 300,000. That's 120 grand. So what you want to do is you want to structure your affairs to ideally pay capital gains tax at least seven years before you die, and then inheritance tax on um, upon the rest of it. Now, if you could say, well, don't worry, I'll just give the property to my kids and then I won't pay capital gains tax. But that unfortunately doesn't avoid capital gains tax. If you make a gift of the property, it's as if you sold it to at market value. So even if you're, you sell it to your kids and they don't give you any money, it's still a deemed sale and you still get a tax bill. But generally paying capital gains tax is a cheaper tax than paying inheritance tax if there's no other reliefs that you can claim. If you wanted to give a property to a spouse, there's no capital gains tax between spouses, so it doesn't crystallise again. So there's things you can do if you want to sort of take advantage of that. But what you need to do is that because these things are so myriadical, then you, if you know enough about your clients, you can structure it mm -hmm. such that there's a ways of taking advantage of it. And if it's deemed to be a business, so I would assert that Pat has got a business here, therefore that would be subject to business relief upon his death, which means it wouldn't form part of the, the inheritance tax liability. So the way it works at the moment is the first £325,000 of your estate is free from inheritance tax. Any gifts you make to your spouse are free from an inheritance tax. If your estate... And you've got to live for a certain amount of years. That's, that's a pet. I'll, I'll come on to that. Okay. So then, if, um, if my estate is less than about £2.7 million, then I can get... A, and, I can, and I leave my house to my kids, then I get another £175,000 for my inheritance tax. That, might, that means my inheritance tax exempt is 500000 Three two five plus one seven five. Now, one of my clients, I, I was discussing this with him. He said, "Don't worry, Chris. It's all sorted. I'm not going to pay inheritance tax." I thought that's fantastic. How are you doing that? Easy. I'm leaving all the money to the wife, and I'll never pay inheritance tax. I said, "Well, what about when she dies?" Oh, I haven't got that far. <laughs> so, you've got to make sure you, you think about it. Now, one way what Matt was saying is a pet. That's not an animal. It's a PET, potentially exempt transfer. So if you make gifts seven years before you die, then that comes out of your estate for inheritance tax. So it's got to be seven years. There is a tapering rule that goes down if it's less than seven years, but what you're doing is you're reducing your estate. So 
no one's got a crystal ball, but if I knew I was going to die in 10 years, you can start making gifts to reduce your estate. And that means there's less of your estate that will be subject to 40%. Because if you think, inheritance tax is quite a pernicious tax. Because I've probably paid 40% or 45% on all my money. And then when I die, they're going to get another 40% on the whole lot. And if you look at someone like my mum, my mum and my dad bought their house in 1964 for £13,000. That's now worth £600,000. They've done nothing to it, and they're going to pay inheritance tax on it. You think, well, wait a minute. Inheritance tax exemptions haven't increased for about 14 years. I'm sure you've had a little word on them, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is one thing I... I don't like this subject, obviously, because it involves deaths, but it's one thing that Chris said to me, he's pretty certain we're all going to die. So we need to sort this, this bit needs to be sorted out, because for those of you who own homes, or especially buy to let, it needs to be sorted out, because it's, it's a scandal, isn't it? You're paying 45 percent <coughs> by the time you get to that level, you're paying 45 percent tax, and then you die, and then 40% is going, there's, there's freaking nothing left. And you get tax on everything. I know it's great for Chris to keep to him work and stuff, but for us it's terrible. So I want to get on to some of the subjects which I know will benefit you, because I know a lot of you. I won't mention any names or nothing. Some things I misunderstood. So LLPs, let's go back to the car benefit again. So I used to always, I've had some crazy cars, haven't I? Like Lotuses and Ferraris and Bentleys. And I've had every car, I think, pretty much other than uh, what's the one Alpi best has? I've got no interest in having one of them at all. What's he, what's, how'd, you, how'd you take me famous? Or the Bugatti? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've got no interest. <clears throat> so I've always bought my cars, never been told by my account of any other different, and I've done it. I've always used finance most of the time because finance is maybe not in a minute, but within reason. If you're going to borrow at 5 or 6%, then you can make more than that on the property investment. So it's, you're better having the cash through. I was talking to this to Chris the other day. So you want to be buying in finance if you can and the LLP element of it I misunderstood it so when you buy a car in an LLP if you're already a partner of that LLP or you, you and your husband are you're allowed one car each all right and whether you had you get finance or not makes no difference whatsoever it's, it's got nothing to do with the finance the company whatsoever at all because you you give a, a personal guarantee on it too and the other thing too is that if I bought, so I bought a car for two hundred thousand um, pounds after drawing money, and like I used to, what was that for, uh, what was a good example? Like that Bentley I had that cost me one hundred and fifty thousand pounds. I bought that, drew drew the money out of my company, so I paid one hundred fifty thousand. What did it really cost me? Two hundred. Two hundred. Would have really cost me two hundred thousand. So I got taxed on that the following year, right? Yeah. Doing it this way round. All those cars I drive are all coming off my tax bill, and it's, it's pre-tax profits. So if I drew the money out and bought it, and this is what I think Chris is really good to get you to understand, which you have to drum it into my head, because I'm not very academic at this type of thing, is that everything is done in your life pre-tax profits, like gym memberships. Pretty much all of you here, you need to stay healthy, be, be at the most expensive gym there is and make use of it because of uh, it's, it's a tax write-off because of the nature of what you do. It's, now, if you draw the money out, then it's different, but if you do it directly, the gym membership is with the LLP, or does it need, need to be with the LLP? So I keep going wrong, isn't it? It needs to be with a member, of, a, a um, partner of the LLP. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. We can still get relief for it as long as it's a business expense. But if I can mm. just explain about the car. Yeah. So say I've got a yeah, car, a £200,000 pound car, that's for business. So what that means is the car's in there, and the, and if it's 100% for business, or whatever percentage of business you, element you've got, all the running costs, the servicing, insurance, are, is a business expense. Now let's assume, that I'm claiming capital houses on this car. Now let's assume that after eight years, I sell it for, I don't know, 50 grand. So I've made a, a loss of 150 on the purchase price of 200. I'm going to get tax relief on that 150 grand throughout the ownership, the life of that car. It, 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 the bulk of the way the Capital Allowances Act have worked is probably the bulk of it I'll get at the end. But I will get tax relief on the full reduction in the, in the difference between purchase price and sales price because it's a business asset. 
And what Matt's saying is that I'm taxed on my net profit, which is income less expenses, which is includes the expenses for the car. And after that, I claim capital allowances on the car as well. So the whole lot is what you get relief for. In a limited company, <coughs> the company would get that, but I personally wouldn't benefit. So to give you an exa example, what I, a, a point I was discussing earlier with this Matt, <coughs> is we were talking about um, if you have serviced accommodation. So we're claiming, we're talking about capital allowances in a serviced accommodation property. Now if that property is in my own name or an LLP, I will claim the capital allowances to offset it against my PAYE income. So if my serviced accommodation in the first year, let's say I've just started trading, it doesn't make a profit, but I've got capital allowances or claims on integral features. So integral features are, I bought, let's say I bought this building, it's got radiators, air conditioning, they're integral features, and I'll claim capital allowances on those. And up to £50,000 is sideways loss relief. So I've got me, my wife, and let's say two kids, four of us. So each one of us could get a sideways loss relief of £50,000. And we can offset that against our other income. So if, if I earn, uh, let's say I earn 300 grand, I'm a 45% taxpayer, £50,000 means my taxable profits aren't 300, they're 250. So I'm getting 45% tax relief on that 50,000 by virtue of sideways loss relief from the capital allowances and the service accommodation property, which is another reason why you wouldn't want that in a limited company. But you've got to know your client to know where you're going to slot it in the first instance. And if your client is doing that, so I've got a client that's buying um, a business premises, and they said, um, oh, that's fine, they're, they're a big property company, um, in Leicester, and they said, oh, we've got these um, business, uh, we've got, I don't know, 13 limited companies, one of them will buy it. I said, oh, you don't want to do that. Why, why don't we want to do that? Okay. When you buy a commercial property, what's the maximum rate of capital gain on a commercial property? Anyone? 20%. 20% is the basic rate of income tax. That's the most you'll pay on any capital gain apart from residential property. So that's shares, commercial property, anything. If I'm buying commercial property, the question is, if, that, if I followed their route, that commercial property would be in a limited company. It would go up in value, and the company would then pay 25% uh, corporation tax on the increase in value of that property from purchase price to sale price when they come to sell it. Then they pay income tax and get the dividend out. If they own it in their own name, they pay a maximum of 20%, so we've saved just on the corporation tax, and, and let alone the dividend tax they would have paid, and we're gonna claim massive capital allowances claims, and then we've got three guys, three wives, so that's 50,000 pounds each times six, I can do sideways loss relief to offset against all their other profits for the year. So you've got to think <coughs> of what asset are you buying, where would you slot that asset into your entity, and how can I benefit from some of the other reliefs? And they said, well, no one told me about capital allowances or sideways loss relief. I said, well, that's why you come to us, because those reliefs are there. It's just they didn't know that I, they could claim them. And go back to the car thing. For those of you who are aspiring to get a nicer car, the fact that you can afford a car like 50% more than what it's, you, you can write not only the purchase price, and again, this works on finance, you don't have to be outright, I, I misunderstood the whole thing entirely. The servicing, fuel because it's all business all of you do business or no all of you personally all business trips um anything that goes wrong with a thing it's all there so you you've got that way of jumping up an extra level because another question that come quite a bit to put to you and the last accounts firm didn't want to go there well got your view on it so 80 percent of this room were locked down on zoom can no longer use physical premises hip they're hit, getting hit now, and last year especially. Last January probably the hardest, because they benefit. You see Simon's move, move forward, look, see? Mm -hmm. He knows what I'm gonna give them, so is Lucy. <laughs> so, in our, so in our industry, we rent halls, basically. That's, that's, all, that's it, so that's what it was. We were told by the government we had to work from home, and the whole house, and it's no joke, I mean, Simon might tell you his house, which took over with boxes and warehouse, his kitchen became his studio for live Zoom classes. It, it, it was interesting times for that two year period. 
and they're now met with these humongous tax bills from last January especially, and possibly this January too, because they received, we did, actually didn't receive too much benefit in terms of grants and stuff, would you have done? No, we got, we got, we received three grants. You got grants, you got taxed on it. Well, we, well, we, paid, but we paid tax on the grants. That's yeah. right. So the, the, argue, the argument of the accountants, well, I mentioned the name of the accountants, that didn't like, they wanted to take the standard 30% working from home when in fact the truth is they honestly did work fully and solely from home not only was it just an office it was the flipping living room the kitchen boxes because they couldn't go out to the storage units and so on is there anything that can be done on that well to start with there isn't a standard 30 percent there is a standard that's what the cameras tell you though yeah yeah when if you if you look go to hmrc they'll tell you use of home as office for um, an employee six pound a week but then the point is that you've just got to go back to the legislation. And we've got clients that basically run their businesses from their home. Now, um, I don't think there is that restriction, but you've got to make sure that you don't, you don't mess up your principal prior residence um, uh, exemption for capital gains tax. And you can do that by making sure that it's not exclusively used for business. Um, and if you've got the, um, I don't know um, whether you need additional insurance, but I don't think you're going to be restricted by that. I mean, we've got clients whose the husband has an office at home, the wife has an office at home, one of the sons has an office at home. So three rooms are used for business, but th there isn't a restriction on being able to do that, no, because you can use it for business. So I know someone has been there and done it, they've claimed 75%, and they took it to our HMRC, and they classed it as um, like an unusual circumstance, used to what's going on in the world, and I can't what the word is now exceptional circumstance and got full 75% for two year period rebated back again but are we too far down the line for that to be done now they got it done on the mortgage they got it done on the um, anything anything linked to the house basically it's a martial artist zoom classes from home every evening I mean it was a bloody nightmare let's be honest one of, it was like two years of now so the way so they had divorces from it and all sorts but so the way it works is a bit like this client that um hmrc are out of time to raise questions i can go back broadly 12 months from the filing of the last tax return and if not you've got to go for something called an overpayment relief which is a letter to them um, yeah, yeah yeah and which means you can go back four years but if you go back four years what you do is you open up your accounts for four years because you say I want to change my accounts for, uh, going back up to four years, which is fine, but that means they then have um, another 12 months to ask questions if you open up those accounts again. So in theory, it's possible. Um, you've got to sort of work out how much you've got at stake and um, whether that would open the can of worms. What your mortgage is versus your bills versus what the potential what, what, risk what, is. What, what, yeah, what the return could be. But there isn't, so what you'll find is like, when, I, when we took over your accounts, um, it's not just the attitude to the tax man. The other thing is that here's the presentation of the accounts. So generally speaking, the businesses in this room, I would suggest, are either small or micro. Now, the question is, what is a micro business? So if I, if I give an example, I've got, um, let's just say, I've got a business. And it doesn't matter if it's a limited company or limited liability partnership. It's got nine staff. It's got assets of um, 300,000 and it's got a 20 million turnover. Does any ideas, is that a micro, a small or a large business? Small, 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 small. Um, it's actually a micro business. And the reason it's a micro business is there's three thresholds. You can fail one threshold and as long as you only fail one and not more than one, then you pass the test. So the threshold for micro business is turnover must not be more than 632,000. Well, I failed that straight away. You can have more than 10 employees, so I've passed that. And the assets in the business can't be more than 316,000, so I've passed that. So that's fixed assets plus current assets. So if I only fail one, it's a micro business. Now, I would suggest a lot of the businesses here are micro businesses, but what your accounts have been filed under is something called FRS 102, which is a small business, which means that more information is released to the company's house. So if I wanted to, I can find out all of your accounts, because I just go on company's house, and I just need to know the name, and anyone can. 
and I could look on the company's house for any of your businesses, whether it be a limited liability partnership or a limited company. They're the two that are filed at company's house. If it's a partnership, i.e. unlimited liability, it's not filed at company's house. But the others I can see. If your accountant files it under FRS 102, and broadly it's, well, the computer says so, so I've done it. But it could have been filed under FRS 105, which means that most of you have got notes to the accounts. And I've read a lot of the notes. They don't even have to be there because they didn't have to file it under FRS 102. So suddenly, the public, HMRC, everyone sees more about your company than they need to. So what we, one of the things we did with Matt is we took advantage of something called FRS 105, which is a micro entity. And a micro entity means it has no notes to the accounts and you don't have to file as much information. So it's sort of knowing, taking advantage of the rules. The rules. If you rang your accountant up and said, why have you filed under FRS 105? They'd probably say, oh, I could do, but you never asked me. Said, well, how am I supposed to know? So the point is, it's just that they <coughs> says the computer says that, so then they print it off. Whereas you think, well, wait a minute, all you've got to do is a lot of this stuff, it's just a case of putting your thinking cap on and saying, well, we could have done this a better way. It's just that no one ever bothered it because they delegated it to junior. a junior. Yeah. And that's the problem. Yes, Pat. So why are you different then? Because uh, you know, one thing that frustrates me about accountants is they don't come to you and ask you. Yeah. Or, to, you know, have you I, I of, thought that was a norm, Pat. Yeah, I'm honest. Yeah. I thought you, they were just know, like a set of accounts. Say, oh, uh, actually, um, they were just stand you know, up. Like can, you know, you, did you realise you can claim for this? Do you realise it's almost like you've given the accounts. They do the accounts, and you just assume it's right. But what you're saying are you different because you actually go to the client and ask them and, and actually probe oh. them and tell them that there are things they could actually potentially gain from okay no, no, it's, why, it's hints. It's like, why are you good at your been, job I could have that been a business job. trip I think because you're interested in what you do and you like it and therefore you're prepared to get in at I know, 8 o'clock this morning when I see you <laughs> now with me Quartz, right, <laughs> so with me um, it might sound a bit sad but I actually sit there reading tax journals at lunchtime because the point is that how can I give the best service to people if I'm not doing it and the thing is that is my name above the door so if you go to the big firms where I worked I qualified with Robson Rhodes and then I was an audit manager at Panelco Forster and when we were there I ended up taking a due diligence team with Lord Beaverbrook to Guyana and we bought the Demerara Sugar Company and half the Demerara River and stuff like that and you do all the fancy stuff, and I went to Toronto and reversed the company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And then when I left them to start work in Southworth, which was 30 years ago, I was the um, CFO of a company on the Vancouver Stock Exchange, and we run that. And we've acted for the largest telecommunications business in St. Petersburg, Russia, the largest landowner in Bucharest, Romania. And a lot of it is that people say, well, I don't want to do that, it's too complicated, or I'm not prepared to read the stuff up. Well. I've never done Romanian tax, but I've done a double taxation treaty with Russia, so I thought, well, if I can do that, I can do Romania. And a lot of this stuff is, is that if you're prepared to read up, so like the trivial benefits rule, you can run through the trivial benefits rule and you can say to clients, well, you can claim these extra expenses. It's, it's sitting there, like FRS 102 is sitting there, and it's just a case of you're not expected to know about it. And a bit like if I join one of your classes, if you don't tell me what moves to do, I'm not going to know. Well, that's, that's the job of an accountant, but there's different teachers for this job and there's different accountants, and it's just a case of finding one that you feel more comfortable with and we're sort of being proactive. And a lot of it is, what, the last thing you want to do as an accountant is that get a client to ring you up and they'll say, oh, Joe, Joe Bloggs down the pub told me I could claim this. Yeah, well, why didn't you tell me? And it's sort of that type of situation. So what we do is that uh, if you look at our website, we do YouTube videos. I think um, Matt might have shown you the one I did with Rob, which is about an hour. We do um, we do LinkedIn posts, so it'll tell you about Spotlight 63, which is one we've just discussed, which is the new tax. And then, then people ring us up and they say, well, my accountant never told me about Spotlight 63, and I've got an inquiry, how do I deal with it? Well, if you're ahead of the game, then they can learn from that. But it's only because you're sort of in the vanguard and learning the stuff, and if you like it, you'll do it. And it's, well, are you good at something because you like it, or do you like it because you're good at it? Well, if you if you know your subject, then like yesterday, I spent six hours on a property course teaching, they're telling us about tax cases. Well, then you're up to date with the tax cases, and we've got an uh, inquiry from a client, then you'll know the most relevant tax case that you can deal with HMRC. 
it's only if you do the legwork you'll do it so then that's how you sort of pick up stuff so a lot of it is you may find that the circumstances or structure you've got is is feasible but not the best and it's not the best because you can tweak it you can move assets from a limited company to an llp and avoid p11d charges you might be able to say well if i'm going to take this person on as a member in llp then why don't we do that because otherwise that they're an employee i'm paying 13.8 percent employers then i for them and i save that straight away so on some an employee at 100 grand that was costing me 13,800 pounds employers and i if I make them a member of my LLP, which they're, they're probably doing anyway, they're probably as good as that, but then they can get tax relief on their car, they will end up paying less tax, I pay less employers than I, all perfectly legit, well why didn't we do that? Just because no one had actually sort of told me we could or put the thinking cap on. Would you say it's the responsibility of a, a good accountant, I guess, to kind of lay out in advance and say, well, you know, you've got this that you can use, you could because I was faced with circumstances just recently where my accountant said to me, well, you know, did you travel or did you go anywhere you know, that we can put through? Did you buy computers this year? Because I can see that you did the year before and you haven't got that on this year. And I thought to myself, I said, well, well, if you would have said to me, I would have traveled. Like, yeah. Why are you asking me? And I said to him now, like, can I go and do something now? He was like, well, no, because we're doing it. You know, the, the they, time's they can't put now. words in your mouth. It's, it, yeah. it's like le leading. You, you got to be good at recognizing that. It's like Chris will never say to me, "You know, you did this, you did this." Tell me the truth, Matt. When you were out in Portugal, did you by any chance record any videos? Did you do any planning for your business? Did you record some content? Were you looking for a location when you're out there? I would, Chris. Probably. Yes, I would. <laughs> and then the kids element, obviously, like you said, yeah. but me and Minnie, because we're both designated partners. Our flights, our element of the renting of the villa, being there for the two-week holiday, which was, I don't know, the cost 15 grand or whatever, off my tax bill. Done. Business element. Business element. Yeah. yeah. And, but I, I genuinely would have loved it if you just like, look, you know, you've got this much allowance you can use on staff parties this year, you've got this, you've got that, you've got yeah. that, you know, the years ahead, you know, it, go for it. That's <laughs> like going down on with some management accounts. I had this conversation with Simon because... There's things you can do now to, that are tax deductible, whereas you might have to spend it on your business to have use of it, rather than hand it over to the tax man in a year's time, when you can't really do anything about it. Like if you need your computer, for instance, for work, or want to upgrade your, your car for work and stuff. So, you know, if you give 50 grand to the tax man, or you upgrade your car by 50,000, as long as you do it through the LLP, it works, it works fine. Anyone got any questions? I want to ask the five questions that Chris now, what's yeah. relate to you and and so on. Sorry. Like, like, LLP, the cars. So, are LLPs exempt from kind? Yes, so the way it works is that. Um, I freaking love LLPs. I've got those documents that bet me every night. Yeah. <laughs> All my cars are with LLPs now, and, and before, and I, I must have spent hundreds, if not over a million, in taxation on not having been told any of this. You know, it's ridiculous. I'm like, Somebody in this recently in this room told me, oh, they won't let me have finance in the, in the LLP's name, so I can get a car. Well, you don't even need that for a car. You can finance in your own name. Yeah. LLP, is, all it is is in submitted into your accounts, isn't it? Yes, so that's the crucial thing. And I couldn't get my head around that. So what Matt is basically saying is an LLP is basically a look-through. So say there's you and two other partners, three of you. Let's just say the profits are £100,000. LLP doesn't pay any tax. If you, you are splitting the profits equally, £100,000 goes in your tax return, £100,000 goes in each of your partner's tax returns on the self-assessment tax return. Limited company is a separate legal entity, so a limited company pays corporation tax. So therefore, if the limited company owns any assets that you, as an employee or director, use, it's a taxable benefit in kind. So that's why the company pays corporation tax, and you want money out of the company, so, so let me um, give you a, an example. I, I wrote this um, article on our website on LinkedIn um, under COVID and a client rang me up and um, I said, uh, how's things? He said, oh, brilliant. I've just um, just had the kitchen done. I said, all oh, right, okay. Um, how much did that cost? He said, 50,000 pounds. So where did that money come from? COVID loan, bounce back. I said, no, I think the company had 50,000 pounds loan, not you. Okay, well, I own the company. Yes, but it's a separate legal entity. 
well, you've got to have taken the money out of the company. All right, all right. Um, call it dividends then. Well, it can't be a dividend because the company needs taxable profits. And then the company makes a profit, then it pays corporation tax, and whatever's left is a distributable profit. And you haven't got any distributable profits. Okay, all right. Um, call it salary. But you haven't got a PAYE scheme. Okay, um, what's left then? Well, it's a loan. That's because of separate legal entity. An LLP is a look-through, so for tax it's not a separate tax bill, it doesn't have its own tax bill, therefore there's no taxable benefit kind for a car in an LLP. So it avoids all that problem, and, it, and you don't have P11Ds, you don't have overdrawn loan accounts, etc. So using that as a premise, just thinking slightly out of the box here, if you've got a property buy to let less than five, and you start an LLP, and you pay tax, could the property be classed as, could a mortgage, could you apply for mortgage tax relief as a business? As an LLP? You can't, LLP, you're taxed exactly the same as an individual. Okay. So you don't, so this is basically what less tax for landlords try to say, and awesome. Spotlight 63 said it doesn't work. So if the properties are in an LLP, it's as if you own them personally. So you're still affected by clause 24, which is what George Osborne brought in. If it's in a limited company, then the limited company owns the property. Clause 24 doesn't kick, but what happens is when the property is sold, the company will pay 25% corporation tax if the profits are above £50,000, and then you've got to get the money out of the company in the form of dividend. Unless you buy some, something else. Well, or if the company else. owns the property, yeah. then yes. Um, but if you own it personally, then it, that doesn't trigger. I think a good one I saw Chris do recently is I won't obviously mention who it is, I'll try and disguise it as I can, but it was somebody who wants to put their child through university and by the time you add up the, wherever they stay, what they call it? <laughs> the, the hostel, yeah. But all the costs associated, it was a lot of money. And you, you, you don't want that post-tax profit, because then you've got to add possibly 45% on top of it again. So Chris has set somebody up with a situation where he's made, the person's over 80, the, the girl's over 18, the child, made them a partner, a non-rights, non-partner, you know, partner, and every, he saved them an absolute fortune. So they get the 12 and a half thousand of release straight away, which pays for the accommodation, which would have cost them, and all the flipping costs for the university has been this uh, pre-tax profit. So, Obviously, for everything like that, the, the HMRC has anti-avoidance legislation. And their anti-avoidance legislation is called the settlement legislation. And that was in a previous spotlight of what people are doing. So say I've got my accountancy business, and I say, okay, I've got three six-year-old kids, I'm gonna give them a share. But if I did that, that falls foul of the settlement legislation because that's called a bounty of settlement, and that income is taxed on me. So it doesn't work if you do it that way. But if they're not minors, i.e. they're not below the age of 18, then there are ways of setting up structures that, that can not fall foul of the settlement legislation, and then you can take advantage of their personal allowances and things like that. So it's just a case of, again, making sure that you, you use their situation to your advantage. Because it can save a lot. Sorry. Um, Sorry. I'll come back to you next. Um, so they bought a car through our NLP. Um, our accountants told us that we should write down everywhere we go, all our mileage. Do we have to do that? Is it such a, such a pain? Oh, you also might have to go for it. Well, Jammer has to go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the answer is no. And I remember one case where um, a client had a, we had a revenue inquiry, it's like 14 questions. And they had a car and an LLP. So, sort of, give us your diary of where you've been. Uh, tell me the mileage on a weekly basis, monthly basis. And he said, this will cost a fortune. I said, no, because I'm not going to answer the question. He said, what do you mean? There's no legislation that can require HMRC, if you're self-employed or got an LLP, to justify mileage. If you're an employee, then it's limited to a maximum, um, you get a, a mileage rate, 45 p.m. mile, the first 10,000 miles. Anything above that is tax. So if I paid someone a pound a mile, then 55p up to the first 10,000 miles is a taxable benefit kind. But there is no, no such legislation for an LLP. 
So you, you just got to know the rules, but you're not an employee, so you don't have to justify I'm trying to tell you, I'm not trying to tell you, I, I months ago. But, but when you when you bike through the LP, does it? How do you class it as like as a pool car or just as a? No, you don't, you don't need to be a pool car. So a pool car is to avoid a taxable benefit in kind and limited company. That's probably what you're thinking of. Yeah. But you don't have a pool because <laughs> you don't need a pool because it's not a separate legal entity. Right. So therefore, there isn't a taxable benefit in kind. So you're not worried about whether it's a pool car or not. What you're really worried about is. If there's two partners in the LLP, then broadly HMRC will say you can only drive one car at a time, so you can't claim for 10 cars. But other than that, they can't say um, there is a benefit in kind, or is it a pool car, because that's not within the legislation. So you just got to know what legislation says. And then say, so they ask this question, and say, not answering, not answering, basically, and then they couldn't do anything. So you just buy it as a straight purchase. You don't even need to own it, you can lease it. Or lease it. Yeah, so you just need to drive it a straight car. car. Uh, lease yeah, cars. That's, that's the most common method. Yeah. yeah, so if you lease a car, don't buy it. When you lease a car, you need to pay lease. Is it is it better to put all your lease expenses and run expenses through the LP? Yeah, you can claim the lease expenses. So generally, if you own the car or will own the car, so say a capital allowance is common, say um, it, higher purchase. Higher purchase is that, broadly speaking, the way the higher purchase legislation works is until I make the last payment, the car isn't mine. Mm -hmm. But we have this thing in accountancy and tax called substance over form, so we assume that you will always own the car. So with capital allowances, you'd have the car as an asset in your uh, fixed assets and you'll have a liability for the capital allowances payments. You claim capital allowances on it. If it's a lease, then generally you won't own the car at the end of the lease term. So you can't claim capital allowances, but you claim tax relief on the lease payments. Okay. So you will get a relief. And that's sort of how that works. The personal one. name is post tax profits. No relief. The car is still under the under the LLP. It doesn't have to be. No, it doesn't. It doesn't it's just okay. you just it just has to be attached to one of the partners. So you're pat. Yeah. And only one each. Yeah. I try so to do it three three. See the thing is I'm a GP, so I actually pay tax as a sole trader because we have the old standard partnership that we can't form LLP because of the contract with government with our income. So with a sole trader, what was wrong? I've heard this before, but I'm sure Chris can get around this. Yes. You're, you're a partner, yeah. but your partner, the tax is exactly the same as the LLP. So if you have a partnership with your other doctors, the, then you have profits, your profit and loss will work out, and you haven't got cars in your business. No, it's our, we, we have our own cars, yeah. But you're definitely self-employed, not PAYE. No, you're self -employed. not me. I'm self-employed, yeah. Okay, so can you introduce a car into the doctor's practice and get tax relief from it? Have you asked? We haven't asked yet. Okay, why don't you ask? So it because has to be under the umbrella. You can have, if you have a car in your name that you use for business, there's no reason why you can't claim capital allowances on that in your business. I mean, we are, we are obviously charging like, on cars, the electricity from the practice, but Claiming whatever you know. Yeah, fees. I mean, I would ask your accountant why you can't get capital allowances on your cars, because a, a partnership is taxed the same as a limited liability partnership. Tax is exactly the same. It doesn't matter that one has got limited liability and one has taxes the same. So I can actually claim capital allowances on. Well, unless, as long as you are self-employed and you're not under um, a PAY scheme from the NHS. <coughs> no, no. Okay, right. So then. There should be a, probably a number of assets. What about computers, laptops? They're all under the company. I mean, under the. Is it a company? I mean, a partnership. Thing. Not a company. No, not a company actually. Okay, right. So then you can claim for other assets you use in the business: mobile phones, laptops, printers, things like that. They're a business asset. So if you've got those at home, and also. If you do some work from home, it may be that on the weekends you occasionally do work or in the evening. But the thing is, I pay my own tax, you see. So I get the profit and then I pay my own tax. So the uh, the, 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 the partnership also we pay all the different assets and everything. Um, but the question is, under my own, like, when I pay the self-assessment, so can I, like, claim cars and stuff? Well, they should be in the accounts, but... Your circumstance is no different from anyone else who's got an LLP. If, if you four are in business, you would pay your own tax, because the LLP doesn't pay tax, or the partnership doesn't pay tax. 
your profits are assessed personally on your self-assessment tax return. You pay it personally. Yeah. So that's no different from anyone else. You'd want to make sure that that car is introduced into the accounts of the, of the partnership and then you can claim relief for it. So it has to go to the account? Okay. It have to be in the accounts. Okay. Claim relief for it. Simon, any questions for Mr. Hawkins? Um, you I, I, tax, I, I'm, you? No, I'm just rattling through all different it's things. It's been a bit let down by the last... <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, I think I think one of the things oh, I always find is I'm always, I'm always really surprised by everything that happens. Because so I'll get a letter from the accountant say you've got to pay this for this, and it's something I never knew anything about. Or so that it's like a line of communication that I need where somebody forecasts my year and says on on this day these set of accounts are due, and this day this is due, and this day on the way up to that we need to do this, 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 and this. And I've, I've not had that. I kind of just get surprised by things all the time because I just I don't understand it. So that's sort of one one thing which sounds like you'd maybe do a better job with. Um, the other thing with sort of like reduce it with trying to sort of claim for everything possible, you're sort of knocking your salary on the head, and that always concerns me because I'm always looking at like moving and buying a bigger house. So I don't want to kind of almost show that I'm not earning any money. Well, don't claim any expenses. But, yeah, then how but, far do you go? Yeah, yeah. How, that's it. That's that's the balance that I'm trying to find. If I want to go and get like a mortgage. But sorry, without being pedantic, you haven't got a salary. You've got an LLP, so yes, that's a yeah. profit share. Yeah. As your year end thirty first of March. Um, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So that means that you your year end thirty first of March twenty twenty three forms the basis of your tax return for the year end fifth of April twenty three. Yeah. So you pay that tax on the thirty first of January and thirty first July every six months. Yeah. So that shouldn't be a surprise. You will get a tax bill every six months. Yeah. So what bit is surprising? They, they, the, this particular firm give you a bill about two weeks before the thirty first of January. So it's not. It's not. But I run. It's I have, to have a limited company as well. Right. And so there's things to do for that. So the limited and company, you pay corporation tax nine months yeah. and one day after the end of the year. Yeah. But it sounds to me like they're doing the accounts late, which means that. Your tax returns late, which means that you only get tell, told in January the tax bill to pay in two weeks' time. That's right. Well, that's down to them. That is yeah. down to them and their timing of, of the jobs. And if yeah. they're not organised, then you're always up against it, and you get two weeks' notice to find X thousand pounds. You think, well, blimey, that's a bit late. I think prior to the last two years, I was just a sole trader. So now you've got there's just more things to do. Like you're to qualify as like an LLP or to make that legal, my understanding of that is you have to act like an LLP. So you've got to run meetings and take minutes, and there's like a set of rules to kind of keep, so that if you no. get investigated, no. So that's it's what, not a separate legal entity. It's not like a company. That's, that's for a limited company. Yeah. So that's what we've been firm. told about LLPs from our current accountants, and then they'll do sort of like these like a confirmation statement, which I think is basically just them telling companies house what you. Well, a confirmation yeah. statement is issued for a limited company and a limited liability, i.e. any entity that's registered at a company's house, and that's on the anniversary of the incorporation. So if you yeah. set this up on the 1st of January, <coughs> then you'll get one on the 1st of January every year. Yeah. And it just says, in your case, who the members of the LLP are, and that costs you 15 quid, you send it off to a company's house, and you send the 15 quid, and boom, that's it. But it, that just every year on the 1st of January. Yes, yeah, so I think that's where we're getting confused, because we're getting asked to sort of sign off something the accountant so the accountant's done something for us that has things in there like you you did these meetings you had these minutes these people were present that's not a confirmation statement that's um, a cso one a confirmation statement right. and there's nothing down in your confirmation statement that says the meetings or anything yes yeah, so that's yeah so i think we just get bits come through that we just we just don't understand so we sign them off and if then you we want, get a bill if you wanted to check you could look at company's house look at your confirmation statement under filing and it's, all it's got, I'm pretty sure the last one of yours says no changes because if you haven't changed the members, then nothing's changed. It doesn't no, say right, about yeah. any meetings. It's just paying yeah. £13 or something. Yeah, just paying yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so we don't do that though. The accountant does that and then charges us a fee for that. So I need to look at these, these are sort of these are things I need to sort of look at. Well, to be fair, that does have to be done. But yeah, if you don't do it, they've got to do it. Someone's got to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I would suggest the biggest problem is the fact that, that you're not getting your information in a timely fashion. And you need to receive that information way before you can the challenge minute. it. Like you can go yeah. to Chris or Chris, by the way, I don't really agree with this six months ago because you're thinking, damn, it's going to be due in 10 days' time. I've got to yeah. find the money. But yeah, that, that, that's what happens that we sort of get the accounts contact us and say, you need to do this, 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 and this. 
and sometimes it doesn't feel like there's enough time to talk it through. So you just end up finding the money, and then after after it's done, you're like, oh. Okay. Yeah. So did you ever say to him, why do I only get it two weeks before I have to pay the tax bill? Yeah, I actually I had a conversation. The, the, one of the main problems with our accountant is that, or my personal accountant, is he's in like a bigger firm. The same as. Yeah. He's quite high up in the firm, so if I wanted to speak to him, I'll phone him or send him an email, and then his assistant will intercept that and say, oh, he's got an appointment, this is just for a phone call, just for a five minute, is this right, is that not right? Um, you can speak to him in three weeks, he'll schedule a phone call for this time. So you can't get access, and then somebody lower in the company than him will come, will maybe come back to you. Um, but it's not. But then they may not be sure about your case. So then they'll say, "Oh, okay, I'll put that to them and I'll come back." And then they'll come back two weeks later. So it's that that line of communication is kind of it was there when we first started, but it isn't there now. So that's kind of always concerns me because I'm never quite sure. I'm not sure because I just don't know anything about tax. Um, and then I end up just kind of going with it because I'm scared of HMRC. That's what happens, and I always feel like I'm paying out really high bills but then I go with that on the on the flip side of what I just said but I've always got half an eye on moving house so I'm always trying to show almost that I'm earning money so that I can move to the house when I do so there's kind of but at the same time I don't want to pay for things I don't think I should pay for or on the mortgage bit so there are companies out there that there's a the minimum amount you've got to draw, which I'll talk to you about later, but it's coming out that all they do is self employed mortgages. This whole myth you can get mortgage if you earn this, don't earn this, that's a load of nonsense. I've got friends who earn zero and it's all get what you get mortgages. You just gotta know the right people, which Gemma can hook you up with. So sorry, just to finish this. If you're our client, um, then normally what they'll say is I want three years tax overviews, which is your tax computation for the last three years. Yeah. And um, we want to know the tax you've paid. Yeah. And if the last accounts, let's say, were 31st of March 2023, then we'd say, well, how about we give you a projection from the 1st of April 23? Because that's sort of history. You're, what, you're lending them money now. So you'll want to know what his income stream is now. So if, for the sake of argument, you've got an active job, if you had a massive car crash, they could say your income could drop. But conversely, we could give them a projection and say, the client's profits are going up like that. And if, you if you're not claiming as many expenses, then your profits is going to be higher. And you could use that as a forecast, as a basis upon which they could rely on the mortgage. Yeah. I'm not saying they're going to ignore what you've earned in the past, but what you've got to bear in mind is that they're lending you money for the next 20 years or something. So it's important where your business is going, not necessarily where it's been. Yeah. So sometimes you can build things into there. Say, well, he's just opened up... Um, another dojo and the income in this year will be X and, and then you can sort of add, you can bolster up your application. You grow 60% yeah. in two years. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. That used to be old information. I think, so. that, I think I, with my, I had a chat with the accountant or one of the people at this firm that we use sort of quite a few months ago and just sort of put some concerns out while I had him on the phone. And they basically said, oh, one thing that we could do is like a forecast. They will forecast what you're going to earn, and then you can work out what your tax bill should be months and months and months over time. Like, but they never did it for me, and I asked a couple of times, and I've never had that. I'm, done. In, the, I'm in the same boat, and it feels like it's just like it's just reactive. And mm. um, I'm at the point where, like, I was like, number one, they messed up the confirmation statement. One of my bank accounts got closed because it was the wrong information, um, and yeah, that caused me a whole headache. And then fine after fine, and I phone him up and I, I said, like, I sent him a picture, got this fine, what's going on? Like, oh, don't worry about that, we'll pay that. And I'm like, well, I do want to worry about it. Like, why are we having fines in the first place? So it's just like that frustration, lack of communication. Is this because the accounts didn't go in on time? Yeah, yeah, with some of those things. So yeah. the, a lot of it is just a case of, it's a case of if they're always late, then you're going to miss the deadlines. And then the deadlines, if, if your accounts aren't filed within nine months of the end of the year, you get fined. Mm -hmm. And your corporation tax has got to be paid nine months after the year. So if you miss your accounts deadline at the company's house, you don't know how much corporation tax to pay, so you're going to get interest fine as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I've got two questions. So the same thing about the sole trader side is uh, my accountant told me that I can't claim certain courses that I've done because it's not within my field. So I'm in healthcare. So it's like, uh, you know, if I'm paid for like trading and stuff. I mean, I, I'm not on a carrot, but I know you need to get a new accountant. 
Well, you shouldn't be sole trader anyway. You, you're in a very legally aggressive situation as a doctor. You could be sued. I know you insured and stuff, but all you, I know you're property, aren't you, too? And yeah, yeah. So you shouldn't be sole trader. Do you have property income? She's a property. Yeah, I've got property income. Yeah. So wouldn't you claim that expense in the property income? But I've been told by another accountant that I can't claim. How many have you got? She's a top professional. I've, I've got two, two accountants at the moment. Why do you have two? One is a company one, and then the other one is my sole trader one. Yeah. So I mean, I'm. But sorry, if you've had one, they can see the whole picture. It's a bit like me yeah, saying, I'm I... only going to look at your left hand, not your right hand, and I'm trying to sort out your ailment, which is your bag, because you're a doctor. But surely you want them to look at the whole body. Yeah, but I, you see, I don't do a lot of the companies. So I let my 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 husband does does it. I mean, yeah, it's it's a whole ball game because I need to, you know, I'm earning more, so I need to obviously sort out some of this. So I but sorry, if you have one accountant, so you can't claim it there against your medical income. I mean, so I don't just, they claim it against that one because there must I've, be claimable somewhere because it's a course for business, isn't it? Yeah, it's for myself. So yeah, I mean, they're that saying, for your business to make more money. Yeah, that's why I was telling him that I'm I'm going for all these like Tony Robbins, you know. I'm going to like all these yeah. courses and they're saying like uh i mean he still allowed me because i was insisting i say so my friends are claiming i don't care i'm claiming it you know so i've claimed so but i'm just wanted to understand because i've got a lot of like mental shape and everything so that obviously brought my income down because i put in a lot of these claims so i didn't dare to apply for you know more mortgages because obviously it's it has impact on just like what the other guy was talking about, you know, getting more. Uh, because now I'm looking at buying uh, like a second home for service accommodation, you know. Because I regretted last time I was putting through a company to buy a, a you know, a holiday let, but I realized that it's actually better to buy under my own name. So because I've actually claimed so many expenses now, so my income has dropped down. So I. I I still can, but I haven't even tried to to get a second like second home holiday let type of mortgages. So what you're saying to me, I can tell them about because now from last time we only own two practices. Now we are we've got four practices. So the income not showing as much because obviously we have to pay for the business acquisition. But in future we'll have income from four practices. So the question is. Can I use that now to look at, because now we've got good deals to buy holiday lets, you see, and yeah. I want to do it under my own name to claim capital allowance. So, so that's the that, two questions, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I always say that uh, it's a bit like, um, I don't know, Frank Dawson, but uh, Frank, uh, Les Dawson, sorry, the comedian. He could tell a joke and everyone would be laughing. I'll tell it and no one will laugh. And it's the way you tell them. Okay. So when you've got a mortgage broker or HMRC, it's the way you tell them. So if you say to the mortgage broker, this is my income, can you get me a mortgage? No, sorry. Or you say, this is my income, but since that date, I've taken over another doctor's practice, my, I've got property income that's going to do this, I've got another, oh yeah, well that's a, that's a good story. And then that's something he can tell to the mortgage company. Okay. So it's just a case of how you portray it. Doctor. That's going to help you a lot. Yeah. The four okay. practices and yeah, I, I know you, your situation can be sorted out quite easily. The problem is you've got two accountants. That's the issue. Definitely. That's Sorry. The thing. Yeah. So I'm currently a sole trader. I'm sitting in like LMP, so I do better. So if I've got my wife as a partner, but she's a full time teacher. How would that affect her? Would it affect her at all? Or is oh. there rules against what that? What line of business are you in? You are sorry. What line of business? Uh, online services marketing. Okay, so you don't have to be an LLP. Yep. You can have a partnership if you wanted. Um, it's taxed exactly the same, and it could be you and your wife. And the way it work, the tax works for your wife is that your wife could have PAY income, which she's got already. She could have self-employed income, being a partner, and she could have other income. And all that happens, you chuck the whole lot in your tax return, yep. and whatever that is, you work out the tax bill deduct the PAYE tax she's already suffered and the balance is her self-employed tax. So for the sake of argument, if you earned, I don't have to answer this question, but let's just say you earned 80 grand and say she earns 30 grand on PAYE, how about, say she earns 20 grand on PAYE, how about if you made a partnership, then we reduce your profit share by 30,000, increase her by 30, and then you're both taxed on a total of 50,000. 
Therefore, you're both basic rate taxpayers. You you aren't paying thirty thousand pounds at forty percent because I'm reducing you from eighty to thirty. I'm increasing. I'm, she's got twenty thousand PAY, thirty thousand self-employed, so her total taxable income is fifty. So neither of you are high rate taxpayers. If you've got kids, there's no clawback on child benefit, and and then she just works out her total profits, her tax bill on the fifty less the PAY tax. Simon, this is the information you should be taking back to your friend who's got a wife as a teacher. Mm. Exactly the same. Because mm. it's almost, you've had one instance where teachers aren't paid an awful lot, it wasn't worth her working. Because by the time she was added on and got the 12,500 relief, and a few other things they could claim for, which is just being business, she was left with 20, 28,000 on a salary of 41. And it wasn't worth her working because he was earning her so much more. So she dropped her job. She was no she paid twelve grand tax on forty thousand. Oh, actually, put be pension and stuff. And all that. Okay. That's what she took out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But Pays sorry, in answer to your question, if you were a partnership with your wife, then HMRC <laughs> can't challenge the profit split. So if I had my wife as a partner in my accountancy business, I can't because she's not an accountant. But they can't challenge the split in the profits as long as she's doing something for the business. So. I can you can fluctuate it in exactly the way I've explained to you. You don't have to say, well, she works one day a week and I work five days a week. It doesn't sort of because they can't challenge that. Is what I'm saying. So you can you are at your liberty to do that as long as you're a partnership. Okay, have you got any questions? You're I've got loads. But... <laughs> <laughs> Draw blanks the one if you can ask. But I think one of the opportunities you're going to have is going to be your three sons. At some point, <laughs> I've never heard them. No, 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 by making them part because they're all coming of right, adult okay. age now, they'll, they'll all be. They'll, I mean, is there anything against them? So, be an education for what? Yeah, they? well, Noah's 16, so he's got a couple of years yet before he can be classed yeah. as a, a, an adult, and I'm not in the LOP. My wife's a teacher as well, and she earns uh, a wage, so we've all got her on the LOP, and she's a partner, and we do the bit where, you know, I. I split it between us to, to lower us down to the tax so we, we're doing that at the moment I just had a few questions about you know like the cars and, and, and the rest of it uh, a few of them have been answered though with because uh, they say buy car under the LP the, the you know basically a buy car under me Richard Kelly but then use it for work so it doesn't have to be in like in, in a company in, the, in a bit of company's name you don't have to you don't have to buy a car in the name of ABC LLP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have to put it in the accounts. So it's in in the accounts of the LLP. When you say put it into the accounts, what, what it goes do you in the mean? balance sheet. You mean so just I'd send to my accounts and they add it on. Correct. Yeah, so yeah. basically you've got it under fixed assets, yeah. which means that then you and if you've got a liability on it finance, then that goes in creditors. If not, the double entry goes to your capital account. And so that's the, the double entry for accounts. And then you can send capital allowances on it. And the running costs on it. And Sarah has a car as well, and she's a member, so we can claim for both of those yeah. two. Yeah, and we already had the cars before we came in LLP. We had when did you become an LLP? Uh, uh, May, 25th of May last year. And you've not done that? No. And the accountant has said to do it? I've never spoken to my accountant, it's the same way as Sarah. His assistant is lovely. She's a lovely yeah, lady. She's like, Every time I ask her, she's not an accountant. Says, uh, I don't know. I'll get back to you. Of course, nobody ever does. They've got all my books at the That's moment. Strange, I phoned them. Somebody was going to phone me back yesterday, and they didn't. And we just, I just can't get hold of them at all. So I'm, I'm panicking because I sent the stuff weeks and weeks ago, and I haven't heard anything. And then I phoned them up, and somebody said, "Oh, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll check. Somebody's going to phone you." Which sounded ominous, and then uh, nothing. So, so I'm hoping that I can get on the phone to them. So we discuss the Asia business trip with them. So yeah, all, all this stuff. Yeah, because I I, yeah. I go away quite a lot. I go to Japan quite a lot. You're going for training, aren't you? You actually are yeah, doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the only trouble you've got is that if you don't get the right person at your firm of accountants, you're not going to get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Can you fix it? Is it too late to fix that problem? Well, Cars. What's the um, what year ends your accounts? Yeah, April. Yeah. April. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. April twenty-three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, have they been so, done? Uh, no. So I've put all my bank statements into the accountants for twenty-two April twenty-two to twenty-three. So okay, they, we'll just tell them to put it in. I mean, you you haven't done the accounts, so so yeah. they can still do it. Yeah, yeah. 
accounts out. I just need to get hold of them. <laughs> but the only trouble with that is those accounts have to be filed by January 24, and that's when you pay your tax. Yeah, yeah. So if they don't do it, you ain't going to know what your tax bill is. I keep getting letters just from HMRC saying, your, your tax is due. Do you need help? Do you need help? <laughs> like, no, they need help. <laughs> so, well, a lot of it sounds like the timing of the firm. If, yeah, if they're not well sourced and staffed, then you're not going to get it out in time. And, other, and also, you're not going to get the right tax release because it sounds like you can't speak to the right person. But it's funny because they've never contacted me. Sorry, you said like they get in touch, but I've never got in touch. So I, I phone them up saying, when do you need it? Do you need this stuff? Mm, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to send it you all. Is that all right? So, so yeah, so I sent it back at, uh, in October. I just haven't heard anything yet. So I'm hoping they're doing it. Like, oh, fingers crossed that somebody's actually doing my accounts. Mm. And it's not going to get to China. I got out. You probably sound like I got out of there. Yeah. I, I used to be able to get, before COVID, I used to be able to get one as mobile, anytime never, I want, amazing. After that, I don't know what's happened. It's just never spoke to the guy. Shocking. Like, I mean, I get Chris on his phone. Yeah. Oh, so we think, oh, yeah, Saturday's on, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, yeah. 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 I want to put the, the, the Japan trips through and the cars through and the home office through. So we, we have a home office, obviously, because like, we were home, so it's the only place an office can be, really. Uh, and then, so can Sarah claim that as well, because she's a member. Um, do you have two offices? Sure. Yeah, because <laughs> 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 <Yes. laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, okay, so Sarah can claim that as well. Okay. I mean, the problem you've got is really you need a sort of conversation, because there's no point ringing her up saying, can I claim tax relief for the car? Yes, oh, goodbye. I mean, how does that work? <laughs> you've got to sort of have a dialogue yeah. and say sort of, well, what else can I do? And if they don't know, if they haven't spoken to you and don't know about your business, how can they advise you? So that's sort of why normally when we sit down, we, we take notes of the clients. Well, how old are your kids? Where were you born? Even basic stuff. You think, why is he asking all that? But it sort of domicile, residence, age. And, and then you can say, well, actually, we can claim this because of that or whatever. Sarah's mobile phone? Is that in or out? Mine's not even in. Yours not even in? No. <laughs> Yeah, it all sorts of stuff. Yeah, you yeah. think clean it all up a bit. Yeah. Mm. At least you've been yeah. a bit quiet. I think the difference between you know, proactive and reactive. Yeah, most of my answers are You've had got answer, answer, yeah. It's mainly around the car and the LLP. Yeah. I've got a sole trader, I've got a sole trader account and an LLP, and my husband's partner of the LLP. Um, but when I've tried to finance my car from the LLP, it doesn't get accepted, so I've had to do it out from a sole trader. That's my wrong advice to you. It should be your That's name. Right. Yeah. yeah, so it's in my name. I mean, it's, it's personally in my name, but it's it's paid out of the sole trader business. Mm -hmm. so you've gone to like a car company. Yeah, to get they it. just won't accept it. Try it out. Finally, you've got to do it. That's my mistake. It's to be in your name and be on the LLP. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Yeah. It's your yeah. best chair machine as well. Yeah, every time in the recent one, they're just like, no, so I just have to give the other account, the other business account, and it just goes through straight away. And I'm like, Did, oh. Does your but husband now my LLP just transfers the cost that I pay out of one. Okay. Every month I set up a standing order. So and does your hus it, husband have other income? Yes, he works. And I don't I don't use anything of his because I don't want to affect his tax, but maybe I'm No, but he has self employed income and POI income. He because has, he's a partner in your business. He's a partner but he doesn't get paid it, so he doesn't get anything. But you allocate he's just there profit. In name only. <laughs> you don't allocate profit no. Which because, I, because I because he owns too much. He owns, he owns I think to, to all of us, and the LLP is quite his new, isn't it? I didn't want to affect his. I didn't know if it would affect his. He's already on a high rate. It sort of he's depends. He's on a higher he, rate. He's already on the top rate. To him, it would just freak him out if I start doing mine. I'm going to start doing this to yours. And, well, uh, you you sort of got to look at it as a family unit. Yeah. If there's no barriers between. I've got two between, children over 18, which. Okay, so you might want to take advantage of that. Which I didn't know about. Okay. But if. if um. What I do is that if that. if there's no tax problems yeah. between husband and wife and they don't care where the money goes and you just look at it as a unit, ideally what you don't want is one of you there and one of you there. Yeah. You sort of want to go like that. Now, whether that is, if that is PAYE, then you can't reduce it anyway. Mm. So that so in your instance, there's probably no point giving any more money because he's up there, yeah. in which case give it all to you. If there is a chance, then <coughs> you want to go like that because... The, the tax bands are quite pernicious. So obviously, anything I earn up to fifty thousand pounds, if it's self-employed income, I get the first twelve thousand pound, twelve thousand five hundred tax-free. The next thirty-seven thousand five hundred is broadly at twenty percent. The next pound I earn will be at forty percent, and then between earnings of a hundred and hundred and twenty-five thousand, when I lose my personal allowance, the tax band is sixty percent, because you're in that bracket there. 
So you want to avoid that bracket at all costs. Mm -hmm. And if, it, if you earn massive figures, then you're going to be into 45% tax mm -hmm. if you earn more than broadly 125,000. But if you have got that flexibility with husband and wife or partners or spouse, you just want to take advantage of this structure by making sure that you can do it. So if, if my wife earns that much and I earn that much and I was a sole trader, I can't give her any money. I've got to be a partnership with her or, a, or an LLP to be able to do that. And you then she's got to do something. Just like you get the LLP open. Yeah, because you and need two members. You need two members. Yeah. So that, that was his purpose mm. for that. Yeah, which I've had an LLP for years and years and years and years. Mm. I think my problem is I feel my accountant is maybe done her job. too she did past, her job. just not up to date. Yeah. It's just probably not up to date with stuff. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's so. like anything, it is hard work. I mean, yeah. if you want to read the legislation and spend seven hours in the course, and some of them, I mean, I remember my old boss, he said, look, I qualify now, I'm not doing it anymore, they can't take it away from me. But then again, what, what good's the advice he gives you? She took a lot of time to try and understand the business, which I appreciated, because obviously we, I have instructors that teach that are self-employed, that somebody else might say, oh, no, they're, they're employed, but they're not, they're self-employed, even then, and all the splits, they really took the time understand the business but it, i feel it's pushed on the stuff that i could definitely i think you and simon can go COVID, you both can go back they didn't there's a lot you can readjust i was working from home they didn't let you claim it and i, I had my normal percentage that would have did you ask him yeah well, i put every bill through which i wouldn't normally do i put everything and they just allowed it it just came back with the normal well my books i got i got my bill the day before it was due it's the first time i've ever done it to me though I always say for my tax, so I was all right because I just paid it. But yeah. I found out. So we're before, Simon, so Simon and Lucy's case with this whole Zoom house thing, they can go back four years because it, that's not multi-million pound things we're talking about. I'm well, worried about reopening. What stuff. we're saying I about, just want to know yeah. going forward, really. I yeah. reopened it and it was fine. I mean, yeah. I wrote letters yeah. to them and they're very honest. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, you just got to be slightly careful. Yeah. You've got to look at the numbers involved because obviously yeah. you've got to redo the accounts. Simon. Simon I don't know, Simon's definitely worth looking at because I know your numbers. Yeah, when I literally, I, was it last year, I think it was, I sat there, just got a business partner, but also got Chris, and I was thinking, oh, I'm dreading this freaking meeting for my tax bill. And I sat there, your tax bill is basically nothing, and you're going to get a rebate on many kids too. I thought you were having a laugh, in you? That was it. So, what we did so, for um, Matt, someone else could have done if they put their thinking cap on, it's not. A lot of it is brain surgery, but if you're not prepared to roll your sleeves up and work out the problems, then you're not going to be able to resolve it. Are you prepared for a meeting, say if me and my husband came up to Barnes, would you be prepared to have a meeting if we brought everything up to have a look at what we've got now? That yeah, type we, of thing? Are you, are you open to that? Yeah, we're for people to do that? Yeah, I mean, it's not a problem. Don't bill me for it, Chris. <laughs> you can bill Matt for it. We'll do loads for Matt. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Just sneak on it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Pat. You, you two would no, better. No, the same from question. I was just yeah. wondering, what's yeah. your diary like? I yeah. mean, I, um, quite, I've got a shoot, but, yeah. but you know, did you I, get a card? I got a card. So uh, yeah, Pat, you're, you're, you're just pass them around. Take, take one each, and then you don't just have give us a ring. I'll tell you why. Just give us a ring when you're. No, I'm not shooting now. So it's no worry. You don't have to shoot at all. Okay. And then I mean. We'd have a chat, and even if you think, no, no, they're doing it right, well, we've got nothing to lose, and I'll just, no charge. Yeah, so if, cool. it help, if it helps you, then great. I'll give you a course ever mean, is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's got a lot of stuff, I've got loads of questions there, but obviously... Yeah, you know, it's yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, of course. It's really hot in this room, is there any yeah. chance of having a window open? Yeah, it's too good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that hot? I don't know, because of that. No, no, no. Yeah. Is there any other mic? Oh, no, oh, so back to my hole. Uh, so I went with my wife and I took my three children. Uh, so I can definitely claim for me and my wife, but not my children. But like, the trip is that it's called duality of purpose. So it's probably easier if we have a separate chat if I need to ask a few more questions. Work out. But broadly, what they HMRC want to do is they want to thank you very much. Oh my god, um, they want to avoid people claiming tax for their holidays. And broadly, if you take your kids, they, they all say that is a holiday and you've got to prove the opposite. So it's sort of a it's more complicated if you take them with you. But yeah, let's have a chat. I'm happy to have a chat. Yes, I'm going to do it. It's probably better when you're less able to everything, it's just separate tickets. 
one for you and your wife. It is possible to do that, um, but you've got to physically. I mean, we had a written inquiry, and they uh, they said, "Okay, uh, show me your diary. Show me what meetings you had when you. If you said you went to Spain for a business trip, show me what meetings you had when you were there." And just think about it. So today, Matt would have arranged this with you. So if you were going to Spain, they'll say, "Okay, show me the correspondence when you met." Mr. Rodriguez in Spain. Show them the subsequent correspondence where you discuss viewing the property, coming back. So they'd expect to see, if you think about it logically, I went on a business trip, you're not just going to turn up without looking at it. You'd expect to see some ancillary information to prove it was a business trip and then what happened after it. So if you did go to view a property, you'd expect to have a spec of the property and then an email after say, sorry, thanks for checking in, I'll have yourself off to see what the purchase of yeah, and, and that view, well, I'm from Cucho, Madeira, and probably I'm going to start investing there in property in a year. So, can I do the trip there uh, as as a business trip as well? Or? Yeah, it's possible to do that. I mean, we there was a, a case of a guy that um, he went on holiday to France, and he claimed it all, and they said, "Why have you done that?" And he said, "Because well, I'm." You know that uh, is that book about Provence? And he said, right, I'm writing one of those. And they said, well, what have you claimed for? And in the end, he said, well, here's the book. But the book took me two years to write. But this is the research on Provence. So if there is a logical reason for incurring that expense for a business purpose, then, then it's tax deductible. Yes, it's my alcohol uh, my home. My back home is yeah, but it doesn't mean to say you're not going there if you are going there for a business purpose yeah. because you're building up a property business, yeah. then presumably you're say, saying that, that will you still be UK resident or are you going to move back to Portugal? Okay. I think I think we'll be like half oh, half. Oh. Okay. It's funny yeah. because everyone's going the other way because you get um, non habitual residency in Portugal and everyone wants one of those golden tickets, like it's really one come and it's 10 years for 100 grand of tax. Yeah. And if you think that covers capital gains tax, inheritance tax, income tax for 10 years, if all the big earners will probably pay more than that a year. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, quick question on uh, pensions and investments. Do you get the same benefits as you do in the interest with the tax allowances on the money that you save? Well, pension benefits are in an LP are the same as if you do it personally. Mm -hmm. So if I earn less than £240,000 and I can put £60,000 into a pension this year. So you'd be making the pension payment personally, not through the LLP. And then you get tax relief on that £60,000. That's the maximum you can pay as long as your taxable income is at least £60,000. So that means on £60,000 I get 20% tax relief on source. So that means that 60,000 pension will cost me 48,000 pounds. And if I'm a high rate taxpayer, I'll then claim tax relief on the balance. So if I'm a 45% taxpayer, I'll not pay another 20, claim another 25%. And if I'm a 40% taxpayer, I claim another 20%. Because you get basic rate tax relief on your pension payments. So 100, 100 pounds of the pension cost me 80 pounds. And then because I'm getting tax relief on that, and let's say I'm a 40% taxpayer, I claim the other 20 pounds against my tax bill. Does it still reduce your profits? <coughs> well, pensions don't ever reduce your profits. What that happens is that your profits are your profits, but it, what it does is it reduces your tax liability. So my profits are my business profits, but then there's other expenses I can claim. So if I invested in a DCT scheme or EIS scheme, I get 30% back off the other investment. And the same with the pension, I would get that money off my taxable profits. So that comes off my tax, but it doesn't affect my accounting profit. But, but I will get relief in my tax return. Is that for LP or for short term? They're different. Yeah. 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 No difference. There's yeah. absolutely yeah. no difference. An LLP doesn't make a pension payment. An individual makes a pension yeah. payment. An LLP makes a profit. Your share of those profits go down in your tax return. Then you claim the tax relief on your tax return for say, thank you. So then, if I make a pension payment, I reduce my tax bill by the pension payment.
Is there a particular um, service or, or type of accountancy that you would recommend if you are a business or a business person looking for accountant to help growth um, and planning for growth and those aspects of things? What an accountant? Right? Yeah. Um, well, it's a bit like me saying to you. Um, do you only do backs as a current practice or do you other things? I mean, you've got to find someone that's specialised in your requirements. And it may be that some accounts, like I say, some of them are basically just bookkeepers and they won't be able to give you their advice because they're not qualified and they haven't got that level of experience. Have you asked your accountant whether you can find a service? I have, but if, if, of course we can do this, we've got experience with franchising, we, we manage this franchise, we do this, we do that, but then it just feels like they just rush off their feet and they haven't got time to, to, to scratch it out really because they're just so busy. And you know, everyone I speak to raves about them, they're great accountants and that's why I went to them in the first place. But they just seem to be just way too busy for anything. And then when I do deal with someone, they'll be like, oh, you know, I'll get so and so to call you. And I speak to someone else who, from my take here, they, they don't know what they're doing. They don't even know why they're on the call with me. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, um, how can I help you? And it's like, well, you know, they, yeah, it just seems... Is there nice. someone saying that you expect Yeah, there's the one guy who I speak to, and every time I... I the thing is, I even session with myself, look, I'm not happy with the way things are going, and I'm not happy with service. And it's like, look, you know, I'll put this in place, and I'll put that in place, and I'll have meetings every month, and all of these other things. And none of them have happened. So it's just like, you're a lovely guy, but you're clearly too busy. I'm sure you don't need a busy guy. No, I, mean, it, 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 I think to the point where, we, where I said, look, I want to get my accounts on, like, to a good level, where, um, you know, we're not backtracking, we're not behind on things, um, where, uh, I said, we discussed as well management accounts as well, so we can have a look at, you know, the different businesses and how they're running, how they're operating. Um, and I've we subsequently been to uh, two other accountants, accountants who had a look at things that said, look, give us your zero access and things like that. I've only had a meeting with one of them, and the one was like, he was like, wow, he was like, why is it all being done like this? It's a mess. He said, you know, if you're with these accountants and these with accountants, I really don't understand why everything's such a kind of um, mismatch with everything. He was like, you know, you guys just like, need to have it organized, and you know, every month, you know, we can provide you a report. This is how you know this clinic was done. This is how this aspect of your business is going, um, and that's ideally what I need. I need that. Not only do I want, um, I think, from my perspective as a consumer of the services, I want to have a clear, laid out kind of tax and, and expense plan to say you've got all of these potential expenses that you can use this year. Um, you know, if you want to use them, these are all the avenues which you can claim. Um, so you can do that. You've done those in subsequent years, so we can do that the same this year, and. This is what's happening this month. This is how your quarter is looking this year. This is what your projected quarter is for next for your next quarter or whatever it is. To have kind of um, something that's going to facilitate growth and allow me to have an overview on my business that can help me plan. And so why did you move to one of those accounts? So I've just had a conversation with them, and then this came timely because to be honest, one thing I didn't one thing I didn't like about that account is first of all he was like we're based on integrity and we're based on honesty and we do everything by the book and he seemed very scared of investigations and things like that whereas the other accountants are completely the opposite they push things right to the line so in my mind I, and he started questioning he was like oh well you're a chiropractor and chiropractic services are exempt from VAT well what about the treatments that maybe you know someone else is doing in your practice they could be you know uh, deemed um, vaccinable if they're not a chiropractor and I was like well my name's on the receipt, so you know you can overlook that. You don't need to, you know, check your pants around that. You know, at the end of the day, we can overcome that. But he was like, yeah, but you know, someone could come in and they could argue this and they could argue that. And I was like, if I really need to spend all this time going blue in the face to try and explain to you, like, he was clearly not a risk taker, basically, from from my uh, and I know him from outside of uh, our arrangement. In the accounts. So that was a flag. And then the other thing is, is. Um, in terms of the costings and things, I asked him, you know, how things work with pricing and stuff, um, and he, he he said that yeah, the, the the fees are based on how much money you're making, and I was like, well, how can that be? Like, I, fair enough, if you want to charge me for your time, if you want to charge me for the work, 
but I had it in mind that, okay, you're going to automate everything, get everything set in systems, accounts are going to be done by themselves, you're going to just need to overlook it with me every now and then. So what's that got to do with the amount of money that's coming in? And he also seemed to be quite surprised with the amount of money I was making as well. And when he looked on the accounts, he was like, oh, was that income for one day? And I was like, no, actually he was like, what's this? Why have you got all of this money coming in? And I was like, that's, that's all the clinic income. And he was like, what, in one day? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, wow, wow, that's really good. You, you, you're doing really well. And I thought, okay, you, you, you're, not, you're not working at the level that I need to be working at. If you're kind of taken aback by those so sorts of things. if your turnover tripled, my work wouldn't triple. Yeah. So, yeah, on my Facebook, yeah. I'm not quite sure how he, how he actually gets to that. Yeah, and that, so there was a few things, like, like I said, I know him from outside of um, that arrangement, and I contacted him because I knew his account, and he asked me before when he first started asking, you know, if I was willing to do my account with him at that time. So I went back to him just to have an outside view. But yeah, there was a few things that just, they weren't sitting 100% right for me. So my take on it was, okay, you know what, I'll speak to a few different other accountants. I need to find the right match for you know, one of my accountants. So, but those are the real things that I'm looking for in terms of the services, yeah. Just how, you know, setting things up well and clear so that it's nice and simple, it's not complicated, so we have, you know, a, a projection of growth where we can make the, the correct decisions for the business. Well, let's give us a ring if you want to chat. Well, one more question. So let's say I do trading in crypto and I lost some money. Can I claim that on my sole trader? But if you if you trade in crypto, then they see what happens is the profits are taxable and loss is tax deductible because you're a trader. But, but my sole trader, I'm like, my main income is from health, but I'm doing other stuff like speaking and... Well then you'd have another source of income, and that source of income would be taxable and tax free for the Yeah, yeah, they're all taxable, we just, uh, we will have to, uh, you know, uh, say, like, like, claim this, you know, like, declare it, sorry, not declare it. But if I haven't really made much money from trading, but I've lost money, can I claim? As long as you're a trader. Otherwise, it's a capital gain, which is a capital loss, which is not offset in America, against your income. So capital is not here. So it has to be traded. It's got to be traded. If, you're, if you are a trader, then the profits are subject to your high trade income tax, and your loss is tax deductible. But I only trade a few times. Well, you've got to pass the badges of trade. Okay. So it's a case of making sure that HMR, if HMRC think it's a hobby, it's a tax I'll do it if it's all right. Okay, I'll do more trading. <laughs> <laughs> Not if you'd like to please. So, um, thank you for coming, everyone, anyway. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, if you want to ring me later, by all means. <laughs> <laughs>